Welcome to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, also known as Snake Rose. right up, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. That's right. Step right up. See the freak show. See the snakes. The long snakes. This is a show where we attempt to explain everything in the universe using only waves and pyramids and snakes. <laughs> now get out of here. You're bothering me. <laughs> so uh, our accuracy level is, has gone down uh, because the show observer is not with us right now. Yeah. So we are going to be back to getting almost everything wrong. No, not all of it, just almost everything. <laughs> Instead of the just, we're getting most things wrong, but not everything before. So, the show observer is in a wreck on the highway. That's right. Currently in a smash car. <laughs> <laughs> or near one. Yeah, so he, uh, he actually recently became an EMT, so he's, you know, following his duty right now, I think. Oh, he says he's back in transit. I just got this message from him. He's back in transit, so, okay. and he's on his way here. So hopefully, he will show up at some point later on in the show and talk to us about Zoroastrians, um, which he'll explain yeah. what that is. <laughs> his only assignment. That's right. <laughs> in a year. <laughs> That's right. Go learn about the first monotheism, uh, and they're probably the ones that built all the. Um, don't don't tell him. Oh, okay. You gotta leave that to Brett. All right. I don't know if he's gonna talk about that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he probably will. <laughs> so we've had no internet for all week. That's right. And since Friday last week. Massive storm rolled in and destroyed our internet. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have a whole lot um, in my in my news stuff, but I think I have something. Let me let me let me let me, let me, let me Yeah, check I was looking at the mine. Um, it just came back today, so we're yeah. Having to We're running running behind here. <laughs> but uh I've been listening to the Book of Enoch yes. recently. Uh multiple times. And when I say listening to it, I'm listening to my phone <laughs> say it. Uh, so that there's not an audiobook that I know of. Yeah. And it's reading and you you got a special version, right? Like one that was sort of Yeah, I need to pull it up. Um but once again, I was trying to talk about this to prevent silence while we're just doing stuff on our phones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who the author is because I wasn't expecting to like be talking about an author, but I actually want to talk about the author of this book because it's not Enoch. Enoch is the author of the Book of Enoch probably. Yeah. But this guy um, sort of made a quote-unquote translation. It's not really – there was already an English translation. He just made it more – more modern, right? It's 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 unlike a religious text, which has all these annotations and all these citations and everything like that. So that half the page is uh, unrelated or like peripherally related or things about translation. This guy kind of made a, a version where if you're having your phone read it to you, it makes sense because your phone will just like randomly start reading citations and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, dude, that was freaking <laughs> me out. Like I I just originally downloaded the PDF of the. The Ethiopian, Ethiopian version or Ethiopic or yeah. whatever they call it. Yeah. Um, and it just was insane because th- there actually was a guy who translated that one too. And he had his notes in there. Yeah. And like some thoughts that he, you know, he would like. Yeah, they're always tell you, yeah. tell you about what a problem with this one word that he just said was or this yeah. part of the word was gone. So he kind of fills in the rest of the sentence a little bit. Yeah. Based on context and all of that. So this dude did. A, a modern English translation. Translation. It's by Andy McCracken. Cool, the Kraken with note with introduction and notes by Andy McCracken. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I want to talk to this guy, Andy McCracken. Yeah, we're gonna... th- this is this is really good. Uh, but I disagree with him on a couple of things, which is uh, fine. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, we have this thing where. We can disagree with people and still get along with them. No. It's pretty cool. We can't. <laughs> oh, shit. Shut up. <laughs> Do I have to leave now? <laughs> I can't even hang out with you anymore. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know uh, the story, the basic gist is like Enoch is um, 
he's he's Noah's grandfather, right? Yeah, yeah, grandfather, and uh, he. Is just minding his own business, bothering no one. Wait, is he his grandfather or great-grandfather? I think you have Lam- his... Lamech was Noah's father, and then Okay, Methuselah. he's Noah's great-grandfather. Right, yeah. Methuselah is his grandfather. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Methuselah is Noah's grandfather, then Lamech is Noah's father. Yeah, and, and they he... lived for hundreds and hundreds of years, so you would have your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather still be alive. Like, that must be really confusing. <laughs> well, well great-great-great-great-great-grandfather told me to do it, and then great-great-great-great-grandfather said I shouldn't do that, but great-great-grandfather said I should do it. <laughs> like, Fuck, this is getting confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. One of the that's that brings up a an interesting point that the that Andy McCracken made, which was that Enoch's age is three hundred sixty five. Yeah. Very strange. Which he thinks is uh, actually like esoteric information about the solar year. Yeah. It's not really his age. It's esoteric. Okay. I've been reading Velikovsky, Velikovsky Heresies by Laird Scranton, and he was talking about this very problem because Velikovsky goes through the, the whole deal, right? Yeah. Uh, and the issue with, like, what is the – why do all these ancient cultures have 360-day years, mm-hmm. you know, which is considered now to be a ritual calendar because it's not accurate, right? They all have – but then at the very same time, all over the world, they all changed suddenly to a 365-day year calendar right. in which the months were um, fluid. In other words, the months were be announced. This is where we get the word calendar from. I can't remember what the original word was, but the word calendar stems from a word that the Romans used that, w- that basically meant to announce the, the month, right? Yeah. Because these, the, these guys are watching and then they would announce like, okay, the next month has just begun. Because they didn't know, because it was like they all apparently used to be the same number of days, yeah. And then, but then something happened, and then they were became fluid. So now we have anywhere from twenty eight to thirty one days. Yeah, right. Well, apparently in the in the Book of Enoch, they're they're they have different numbers of days because he goes through one of the parts of the book that I really want to talk about um, is when he's describing basically the the day night cycle. Uh, all throughout the year, like the different ratio of day to night. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he goes, you then you wait for thirty days, right? Then, yeah. Then it's like this, and then you wait for thirty days, and then it's like this, and then you wait for thirty-one days, and then yeah. it's like this. So they change. Yeah. Uh, I didn't hear a twenty-eight in there, but <laughs> February, <laughs> dumb. <laughs> but it doesn't have to have a twenty-eight, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I remember you talking about that. Yeah, I do want to hear you talk about that again because that was a that was a really badass part. But yeah, the basically. The uh, oh god, you know Ty, <laughs> Ty. Ty's calling again. Me. Yeah, he always, knows. He knows. Tuesday night, Snake Bros. <laughs> like, what is the deal? It's it's Snake Bros. Time. Fuck off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that ought to teach him. <laughs> yeah, take that, Ty. <laughs> Whenever you hear this, take it again. <laughs> take it twice. <laughs> That's right. You're gonna hear it just now, and then when you listen to this, you're gonna hear it again. Take it twice. <laughs> Stop calling us again <laughs> on Tuesdays at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah now he's gonna send me a text watch <laughs> hey what's what, what's going on <laughs> so okay so anyway that you might be right i don't that's that's the opinion of andy mccracken that the yeah. 360 or 365 whatever it was was the the solar year which what? is a good i can't remember which one isn't enoch one of the ones that never died he, he didn't die he was whisked away by god like like noah so like he doesn't really have a so his age can be esoteric because there's no known. You see what right, I'm saying? Right, right, right. So they could say, yeah, yeah, three or sixty-five years because he's like the he's also. Yeah, the, I thought that I I remember hearing from either is in Graham Hancock or somebody's whatever one yeah. of these other books where Enoch just like gets taken up in yeah and he um, was into but, the heavens and then right. whatever he and that was a gift or whatever it was called a gift like with Noah but, you know Noah and his wife and the steersman leave the ark to go onto the land or whatever yeah. and then like they just don't ever come back inside and people are like in, inside like what where did he go and then they open yeah. the door and God's out there and he's like sorry I took him away yeah. uh, <laughs> he's gone but, but <laughs> as far as I know and I could be wrong because I uh, you know I'm listening to this while I'm at work yeah. but uh, I that's not in here that's not in this book that he that, that he doesn't die and just goes up into heaven and vanishes okay. or whatever the end of the book I think is mostly like his his uh he does these like parables yeah and prophecies and but shit. It, but the book of enoch was supposedly written by enoch so it shouldn't have anything about him disappearing forever yeah <laughs> okay so i'm gonna go away for <laughs> that's right i've I'm, I'm, I'm di- i've disappeared 
<laughs> well, I'm saying that that I can't remember this for sure. I don't remember hearing anything about like, okay, and now I'm going with the gods. And right. Never uh, took yeah. a turn. Probably he didn't know that uh, at the time. I don't know. Wasn't he – isn't he also probably Tody, like Hermes Trismegistus, like the – I have no idea. The god of knowledge, right? Because he, he was taken up and told to write all this shit down to give it to the humans, right? To, right. Like, well, okay, that's that's the weird thing is that that I've heard people say that too, that, like the Pillars of Enoch, that, yeah. that type of shit. Yeah. But I think that's like what what he was in, – in this book, basically, he is told to be a scribe. Yeah. They make him their scribe. Right. Okay, so basically – take dictation. Enoch is Noah's great-grandfather and he's just – Minding his own business, bothering no one. <laughs> and some, like, quote-unquote angels approach him or whatever, the, the watchers. Yeah. Um, and they... We've been watching you. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> come with us. And they basically take him into some crazy shit that he describes as, like, um, a room made of crystal. Yeah. And there's, like, tongues of fire, like, coming out of the walls and out of the ceiling and stuff. and um, And then... They take him into a room where he sees, like, the, the basically gods in there or whatever. But first he passes, like, all this crazy shit. And there's one one that's, like, a prison. And he's like, it's so terrible. <laughs> and the prison is for the the angels that do bad things. Yeah. Like, you know, the fallen angels or whatever. The, and, all like, all the horrible things that they're doing to them or whatever. Yeah. And, and Enoch's <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, you know, he's <laughs> feeling sorry for him. And the other guys are like, dude, don't feel sorry for those guys. Yeah, yeah, they're bad. They're bad. But uh, yeah, that anyway, cha- they, the chain that's that's eating his guts forever, <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they tell him they they basically tell him that they want him to be the, their scribe to write down a bunch of shit. Yeah, and um, they teach him how to write. So he doesn't know how to write or read, and uh, so he learns all this stuff from him. They teach him astronomy, and then that seems like a pain in the ass. Like we need a scribe. Let's go find a guy who can't read and write. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's like there's ulterior motives there. They don't really, they don't really want to scribe. They want somebody, so they want him for something else. They want him to write all this shit down, but why do they have to teach? Why don't they go find somebody who can read and write to get a scribe? That's what you usually do. Yeah, I don't know. Why didn't they just do it? <laughs> yeah. It like, doesn't make any sense. You guys can read and write, you know? I, I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it doesn't make sense as him just being their scribe. It does make sense maybe if you, because I always thought that he was told to take, like he was before the deluge, right? He was supposedly told to, to sort of compile all this information into these tomes and then to bury them mm-hmm. beneath the various places. They would say before, beneath the floor of the temple of Jupiter or whatever, all this stuff. And then so that they could be retrieved after the, the deluge. Um, right. But I don't know if that's in the book of Enoch. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like, okay, so the way it goes is I'm listening to this book, but I'm at work. Yeah. And so I know that there are parts of it that I miss, like completely, <laughs> totally miss because yeah. something's going on. Or like I take my headphones out, pause it, and then my phone's moving around in my pocket and it starts playing. Oh, again. yeah. Yeah. So I have to listen to it multiple times and I've, I've, only, on, I've only gone through it twice. Yeah. But the main thing that, that really stuck out to me. So I can't I, – at this point, I can't report on the story as like an authority on the story. Okay. Right? And I don't know it that well. Yeah. Um, but – what I can say is this one part really jumped out at me, you know, and I'm just doing all this stuff at work and, and I'm hearing him talk about this day-night cycle thing yeah. when he's being taught astronomy. And, okay, so the, the, the part where he's been taken into the ship, like, or, well, I'm calling it a ship <laughs> yeah, automatic. It's obviously a spaceship, guys. Right. <laughs> uh, it, it, he's being taken into this whatever yeah. structure that the watchers have and he's taken up to, to see the most high or whatever. Yeah. But there he's shown all kinds of stuff. So he sees lands, like distant lands and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And and so it, it's it seems clear. And then he sees the gates in, in heaven yeah. and like the gates of this planet and the gates of that planet and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, it literally sounds like they brought him into a spaceship and yeah. took him up into the sky and showed him shit. Yeah. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, but – like it gets to a point where one of the angels or one of the watchers or whatever is is going to teach him astronomy, and that's the part that really jumped out at me because we've been studying astronomy, and we've been working on the Hill Hinge project. That's right. And so you know we're learning shit about the motions of the of the sun through the sky, and that's basically what he's being shown. Yeah. All right. And 
I'm listening to it and it's basically like, okay, so you start on this day or whatever. And the day, the daytime is equal to the nighttime. Well, obviously that is the equinox. equinox. Day and night are of equal parts. Like that's what, that's the way he describes them as parts. Okay. And then he goes and you wait 30 days and then you look again and the sun has moved, you know, north or whatever. And the, the day is now this long and the night is this long and they're, you know, the night's getting longer and the day's getting shorter. Yeah. Then it goes the other way. And basically he's describing like, you know, the sun, the, the earth going through the seasons and like the day's getting shorter or the day's getting longer. And at one point he gets all the way to where he says the day is twice as long as the night. Basically it's, it's longer than the night by a double part. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, or, or double the night. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, that's the solstice. Cause right after that, it starts going back to where the day's getting shorter again. So I'm like, I know based on the research that we've recently been doing that, that there is that depending on your latitude, the longest day, like, cause if, okay, if you're at the North pole, then, and he was told this by the, by one of the angels, like there are places in the world where a day yeah, is yeah. one half of the year and the night is the other half. Yeah. Right. So if you're, if you're all the way up in the North pole or you're all the way down in the South pole, then, then a day is half the year and a night is half the year pretty much. Right. right? So, uh, I'm like, I know that there's a specific latitude that at the solstice, the day will be twice as long as the night. Yeah. And there's only going to be one of those yeah. on, in the Northern hemisphere, which is supposedly where they were. I guess he could have been in the Southern hemisphere. So I'm like, oh, I'll check it out. Turns out it's 50 degrees. It's roughly around 50 degrees north latitude, which is way up there. Yeah. Like Russ, Russ and I were looking at it on the map, and it's like it goes it, yeah. through Russia and yeah. Canada, China, yeah, yeah, Europe, upper Europe. So it's it's nowhere near the Fertile Crescent. It's nowhere near Israel. Yeah. So that was one of the things I wanted to talk about talk to the, if I ever got a chance to talk to the author, because he, his thought, you know, he was talking about the possibility of like, uh, you know, polar shift or the poles shifting on the planet, which is a theory that is, it's probably happened before. Yeah. But, uh, I don't really buy into that in terms of like recent human history. You know, I, I don't. Okay. So this is what Velikovsky talked about, right? Yeah, and that was his whole thing. So, like, I, I re- I'm reading that stuff again, and I'm like, man, that's really convincing. It's really convincing. Like his whole, like he's been, he's right about so many things, and I'm just like, wow. The pro- yeah, the problem that I have with it is that if we had a polar shift, it's highly unlikely that after that, any monuments would be lined up with anything. Yeah, and all these ancient monuments are all lined up to shit. You yeah. Know? Well, so it's like either they were all built. After the pole shift, yeah. in which case this book of Enoch is probably not from before. Right. Maybe. I mean, like that that's one of the things that Larry Scranton is talking about. Or is it? it's extremely old. Yeah. And it's the oldest thing that we know of. Yeah. Because the other other texts that we have are associated with cultures that have built stuff that's aligned. Yeah. So like this would be the only text that I know of that has a description in it that's astronomical. And well, it doesn't matter what this is. It's yeah. like if if he's supposed to be in Israel, and that's the whole idea, it seems more probable to me that that idea is wrong than that it's the only text known that is from a guy who was before who wrote something down before the poles shifted, and then everything else we know of was after. That okay, just yeah, doesn't seem probable. I, yeah, I agree with that. I don't think that him being on the fiftieth parallel or the fiftieth latitude or whatever is is explained by a pole shift. On the, That's what I'm saying. Okay, that was yeah. the point of the author. Like, well, perhaps he was writing this down before the pole shift. Yeah, no. I mean, and I, so yeah. Israel was up at a place like, right. That, that, that's just because he wants, no, no, I'm sorry. That wasn't the opinion of this author. This is somebody else that I, that when I was looking this up, I saw some other people mm. who had, had written opinions about it. My yeah. bad, Andy. So those people are, it's want, not you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those people are just wanting him to stay in Israel. And like, they're, probably and they're, yeah. so they're having to make a pole shift happen to put the Israel at 50, at 50 right. or whatever. Well, I, I don't think I disagree with that as well. Um, but I do think that like, if there was some kind of rollover or pole shift or whatever, or even just a, just a, you know, knocked off kilter that I think that the current monuments 
were probably built right after it happened, partially because it happened. Okay. And yeah. Now, kind of, if that happened, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. And 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 so the pole shift is old, and the on monuments are much older than we thought. And like Larry Scranton kind of goes through the whole thing. He's like, "Look, Velikovsky put this into very recent history, like relatively very recent, like three three thousand BC." They, to me, it all the all the the main ones that you know that we know of that are have these badass alignments and stuff. There is evidence around those areas that all point to roughly around 12,000 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Right before the end of the last, or right after the end of the last ice age. Yeah. So if there was a pole shift in that catastrophe, that would make sense. Right. But I don't know. Yeah. And we know it was, it was probably caused by a comet, right? The, the catastrophe, not, not necessarily. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the, there's a, the whole thing with the, the, the pole shift is that it was a comet. It was Venus, right? Venus was cometary up until very recently. I mean, that you can look just just as recent as like Copernicus, like fifteen hundred A.D. Copernicus Copernicus's like records of Venus's movements in the sky do not in any way like conform to what we see now. So. Right. So they think he's wrong, but that's that's where the electric universe comes in, and that works badass because they're you know the idea is that these bodies can like once they get into a system. They will very quickly be regularized, ushered yeah. towards the the point where they fit in to right. the you know to the basically the the entire system of energy in that plasma yeah. stream. Right, that works for that is yeah because there's a lot of astronomers that question Velikovsky's explanation. Like, well, how did it get normalized? You know, like in, in right. thousands of years, it should be. You know, and like Sagan went through this whole deal of like like Sagan hated hated Velikovsky. Like he did not yeah. like him at all, and like. He did this whole bullshit where, you know, like the, the, the post, post predicting the past crap, right? Mm -hmm. Where he like does all these calculations of how extremely unlikely this is, right? And Laird, Laird Scranton points out that he's like, well, you know, kind of if you, if you do that same thing for the universe in its entirety, like how ridiculously unlikely it is that the universe just so happened to be just perfect for us to be here. Like you can kind of just, just using that same logic, discount the existence of the whole universe. So that doesn't really yeah. work. <laughs> unlikely things happen all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so one of, one of the things I want to do uh, to follow up on this, and, and I'll, I'll report back when I get the chance to do this, but I want to get on Google Earth and load up. What is that? Thing you gave me that XLM file or whatever it is, KMX. The KML. The yeah. KML file. That, that has all the thousands and thousands of sites. Yeah. Yeah. All these all these ancient sites. And yeah. I want to get on the 50th parallel in the uh, north, yeah. 50 degrees north, and just cruise around the world and look to see what sites are there. Yeah. Especially in the, you know, the the eastern right. area, right? Yeah. And then And then go to the south. Because, dude, if they took him in a freaking ship where he could see like distant lands because he describes like seeing these lands that he's never even imagined yeah. could have existed right and some of it almost sounds like they took him to different planets like it, you uh, know yeah. what i mean it's like it's crazy but i don't know but it's well if it was pre, if, if it was pre-cataclysm some of it might look like different planets i mean you've got these enormous but still planets. even it still does today like you go to different parts yeah it looks like, like holy shit <laughs> <laughs> like what Earth. is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it, it seems like they took him that and showed him all these distant helicopter. lands and like yeah. In another part, they're they're describing to him that the the moon, the light of the moon, is actually the sun reflecting off of it. You know, yeah. they weren't flat earthers, by the way. Right? Yeah. Take but, uh, flat earthers. <laughs> yeah. So I'm part of the flat Mars he, society. He's by basically the way. T and he gives <laughs> he he says the guy's sp uh, specific name. One of the one of the watchers. He's like one of the leaders of the watchers who taught him about the moon. Uh, it's really, it's Azazel, really badass. Azazel. I don't know. What, I can't remember what his name is, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, like it, when they, when he's describing the, the, the sun rising and the different night and day cycles, yeah. I'm like, when they were teaching him this, they needed to do more than just to tell him exactly what he's writing down. Yeah. Like he understood it. Right. So how did they do that? They must have taken him to a hinge. Yeah. And shown him like. Watch the motions, right? Like yeah. take him there and this is how once you a month. Extrapolate that it's balls rolling around his face. Right. Yeah. Take him there once a month. Show him, and because he talks about like the sun rising in gates and that, that yeah. kind of stuff. I, I was telling you about this, and you know he uses these terms, gates and storehouses or whatever, and it's like his language didn't really have the words to yeah. describe it, or it's our it's our. It's the translations of it that didn't have the words to describe right. it. Right. I, mean, I don't know what language he wrote it in. Gates of heaven are 
a pretty common thing in ancient times. Like they would consider certain things to be gates. And they, there was always a reason why it was looked at as a gate that once you read it, you're like, oh, OK, I could see why they would call that a gate. Right. But I was thinking about a, about Stonehenge, right? Yeah. Who the fuck builds a Stonehenge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about Stonehenge and it's like they made gates that the yeah. the sun rose into. Yeah. Right. And that's what I was thinking, like, dude, he, he talks about the gates and it's a perfect, it, it makes sense in terms of a gate, like, because it's coming through, you know, this sort of passage or whatever, yeah. except that these actual astronomical observatories are built with gates. Yeah. Right. They're all big gates. They look like the little things on the bowling pin hats and the yeah. freaking Egyptians wear. Mm-hmm. And there's the sun disc coming through it. Right. So. That that was just really cool. I think if if there's a if there is a badass like hinge type or like well aligned sort of astronomical structure somewhere on one of the fiftieth degree parallels, that would be badass. Siberia's like, in the fiftieth, right? It's pretty pretty north. It's like uh, I don't know. I need to look at it more closely. Well, I, mean, I just did that. The fifty line was running alongside the like I would say just above the Can- uh, Canada U S border, mm-hmm. right? That's pretty far north. I mean that's. That's yeah. not Arctic Circle, but it's close, like Siberia, right? Like Alaska. You know, parts of Alaska and Siberia are in the Arctic Circle, but right. there's a whole bunch of them that are in the, I don't know what it's called. It's not temperate or whatever. It's the, the, the area below the Arctic Circle between the and the temperate zones. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the reason I'm saying this is because I remember, um, I must have read this on Ancient Origins. It was years ago, but they had this thing about this site that they found in Siberia. And it's like, I looked at it and I was like, okay, that, that was a lab, right? Cause it's, it's this beautiful, like rock cut, you know, gigantic blocks or whatever. And it's in, it's in the middle. It, it completely covers the island, an island in, in this lake, right? So this is Siberia, which is like all frozen tundra and like hardcore, you know, you gotta be a badass to survive there now. But there's this enormous megalithic site that was never occupied. Like the, the researchers that have gone there and kind of dug around in there are like, we don't, there's no signs of any – like they built this and just never used it, mm. right? And I'm like, that was a laboratory or something. Like it's clearly not something to be lived in, but that somebody met, built a facility, used it for whatever they're going to yeah. use it for, and then left. And we just have the remnants of it. And I mean it goes to the edges of the island. Like the island is the foundation of this thing. Wow. So like, if cool. you left the building, you're in the water. There's nowhere to walk, right? <laughs> so I'm like, how do they build it? Like it's freezing there. Like you can't – you know what I'm saying? Like, Well, I wonder what's under the water around it. Yeah. You know? It's Maybe one of those the top of a one of those like super deep ancient Siberian lakes too, you know, like big massive fresh water. It's like thousands of feet deep. That's cool. I'm like, how did they get an island in the middle of this <laughs> thousand foot deep lake? Anyway, I looked at that. So when you were saying that, I was like, I wonder if this is where they went because like that's in the right area. Yeah, and and you could. That's s- what I'm saying. We need to cruise that freaking 50th yeah. degree parallel, both north and south, because dude, South America. Yeah, like I there, there's got to be something right down there. Yeah, and near the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> wherever it is. And like, so when I looked it up, it was I just used the Wikipedia thing, like fifty degrees north latitude. Yeah, and it it shows this sort of tiny picture of the whole world map with yeah, a fifty line degree on line on it. Yeah. And then when you click on the picture to enlarge it, the line's gone. Yeah, because the line is just superimposed. On <laughs> yeah, the, picture. the line's like a flash thing <laughs> superimposed. I was like, dang it. Yeah. So I haven't had more time, but I'm I'm gonna do this on Google Earth. Um, another interesting thing to do on Google Earth is to cruise the 33rd. Period. Yeah, 33rd is cool. weird. Yeah, uh, Moundsville. But yeah, there's one other aspect of the story that I want to talk about that that also brings in um, what I remember about the Sumerian tales with uh, that concern the flood, um, Enki and Enlil. And I, so I've, after reading the Book of Enoch, because it it describes like a lot of other details about the flood and what was going on around yeah. it and Noah and his life and how he came to be. So I want to, I just want to briefly talk about that and some of the strange, like uh, the way these stories sort of conflict, but that, that might actually mean there was something deeper going on yeah. in my opinion. So I mean, I'll I, talk about that. About I, I did know that. Break. Yeah. It was surprising to me. The whole thing that Noah was like, not, that he was not a regular human baby. That that shit was surprising to me. Yeah. Like, I I really was taken aback by that. I was like, wait, what? You know, his, his dad's like, he's not mine! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that fucking bitch is goddammit! <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Yeah. Let's take a quick break. Yeah, I'll take, yeah. take a break. No, wait. Let's keep going. <laughs> Snakes. Conversation by two limited individuals, and sometimes three, and sometimes four. <laughs> brothers of the Serpent Podcast. <clears throat> no, no, no. Higher brothers limits. of the Serpent Podcast. Coming to you from the ten by ten by ten tangent cube of science. And we're getting back to the Book of Enoch here, just for a minute. Um, one of the other aspects of it that I that I find really interesting is uh, uh, the the birth of Noah. So stick with me in these names here. I'm, I'm trying to memorize them. But so Noah's father is Lamech, and he was married to, um, I can't remember her name, but basically his father. Not important. She was a woman. His father, Methuselah. <laughs> uh, you know, back then they, the, the fathers like chose wives for their sons or whatever. So yeah. he, so Methuselah picks Lamech's wife and they have a son. And basically, the story is that that Lamech comes running to his father Methuselah, and he's just like, "WTF!" Like he came out, and his his skin was all bright, and then like he opened his eyes, and it it they shine like the sun, mm. and lit up the whole room. Wow! Basically, he's describing one of the shining ones, what the Watchers look yeah. like to Enoch. Okay, like their faces shone, and their eyes were like fire. Um, and they, in like literally in the book, it says that when he opened his eyes, the room lit up, like it, it wow. brightened the room, like a, like the sun. Wow. That's what it says. So Lamech's like freaking out and he goes to his father, Methuselah, and he's telling him all this and he's like, it's one of them. It's not a man. He's not like us. He's like them. You know, and he's talking about the watchers basically. And, uh, Lamech, the, the way the story goes is that Lamech tells him that he talked to Enoch about it and it was cool, right? It was supposed to be that way. Don't worry. It is your son. Uh, Methuselah tells Lamech that, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Methuselah tells Lamech. <clears throat> what did I say? You said Lamech tells okay. him. Methuselah tells Lamech, Lamech that he's talked to Enoch about it and it's, and it's all good. And yeah. that it is his son and he's supposed to be that way. And the reason why he's that way is because he's going to do great things and he's the chosen one uh, to to take mankind through the calamity that's to come, right? Yeah. Um, now, this part is uh, talked about by the author of, of the book that I'm reading by, you know, it's Andy McCracken. So Andy's thinking that um, this part of the book might have actually been written not by Enoch, but by Methuselah. And one of his reasonings is because it seems like Methuselah didn't really have a chance to go talk to Enoch about it. He just tells him like, yeah. oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know. I disagree with that because – You could have talked to him about it earlier. Yeah, yeah because if <clears throat> apparently Enoch knew all of this stuff was going to happen anyway. Yeah. So it's like when the father is picking the bride, they can make these types of plans come yeah. to fruition. Okay. So my thought – here is that this this has happened before or actually it happens later really yeah. and before yeah but in the story of of Jesus basically Mary uh is visited by an angel and then she has a child right so it's kind of the same way with the story of Noah except there isn't really a story about her being visited by an angel but the weird thing is that Noah appears to be a crossbreed between humans and the Watchers. Right. Which is against the law, according to God and the Watchers, right? Uh, this this is one of the reasons why Enoch was picked up in the first place, because there was all this bad stuff going on where the Watchers were 
had come down from heaven and like 200 of them had decided, you know what, we're going to break the law and yeah. we're going to go take men to be our wives and we're going to have babies and those babies are going to be giants. And take the gonna, daughters of men. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> they take men to be their wives. <laughs> take the daughters of men to be their <laughs> <laughs> Modern day. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Some men have uteruses. <laughs> <laughs> Did I just really do that? I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they took the daughters of men to be their wives, and they had giants, and the giants just devoured the earth. Yeah. The, this pissed off God, so he decided to destroy it with a great flood. So this is like the, the sort of abridged story we're given in Genesis. Yeah. Uh, but – Basically, Enoch is picked up by these people and he's shown all this stuff that all this bad stuff that's happening to these watchers who disobey. And he's told by, you know, the the most high and the watchers that these bad watchers that have chosen to take the daughters of men to be their wives and had families and had giants and all this stuff that were devouring the earth. They were all going to be punished and they were all going to watch their families be killed in the great calamity to come. Right. So he's being told all this stuff by these guys and so he thinks apparently that that the fallen quote unquote fallen uh, angels who who mixed and mingled with men are really evil and that they taught mankind all kinds of evil things like medicine and how to <laughs> yeah. smelt metal metallurgy and, make, and yeah, yeah all all these Holtus evil things making and yeah right <laughs> terrible terrible evil terrible, things terrible horrible evil things yeah so makeup it seems like, like the way, uh, like the way Graham Hancock describes him, it sounds like he's like, sounds like Enoch was just a bigoted old shaman. Yeah, that's right, it's a bigoted old shaman. <laughs> yeah, right. and he didn't like the way the world was changing around yeah. him, right? Yeah, a bigoted old shaman. <laughs> it's freaking great. <laughs> but okay, this is why this is strange because if Methuselah really goes to Enoch and tells Enoch that Lamech. Just had a son with his wife who was chosen, and that son looks like one of the watchers. Then Enoch would think, if okay, was, yeah, if he was a bigoted old shaman, if he was a bigoted old he'd shaman, be like, well, that fucking bitch, blah blah, yeah, sl- right. laid with one of the, and watchers, he would yeah. try to go, he would go to the watchers and say, hey, there's crossbreeding going on down yeah. here. We need to find out the culprit and destroy them, right? right. That's not what happens. Yeah. Enoch tells like, hey, it's Methuselah cool. is like, no, 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 dude, this is cool. This is yeah. this is the way it's supposed to be. And that boy is going to grow up to be a man, and he's going to be the one that, like, saves the human race from the destruction. Yeah. And the Bible says that he was righteous in all his generations, okay. which is weird, so this, when, right? Right. But this is the thing. In the Sumerian tale, the, the, the characters that make up the people that would have taken Enoch initially up and said that, you know, the angels should not mix with, with yeah. the daughters of men and all that— that would be Enlil's group. Right. Right. The ones that came down and mixed with mankind and all that, those would that would be Enki's group. Yeah. And then in the Sumerian tale, it's Enlil that doesn't want any of mankind or any of the mixed breeds to know that the calamity is coming. That's right. And it's Enli it's Enki that breaks those rules and goes and finds Unishtapim or whatever is freaking yeah. <laughs> and tells yeah. him th- across the wall like he's talking to the wall and he's like hey, yeah. hey not wall. breaking the vow hey wall you should probably build a boat wall <laughs> right right if I was you wall I'd build a boat I'd build a boat about this size <laughs> and about that size yeah I'd probably make it this big and that big and wall. then I'd go gather up all the DNA in the planet and put it in there <laughs> I'd tear you down as wall, a matter of fact I'd go break into this really great building that <laughs> yeah. Inky built that's full of all that DNA <laughs> <laughs> And you can take it all and put it in that Yep, boat. that's what I'd do if I was you, Walt. <laughs> <laughs> right, so Enki is the one who would have been on the side of the fallen, who breeded, you know, crossbred with, with the Adamu. Yeah, trying uh, to raise them, basically. Right, and, yeah. and taught them all the knowledge and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, there's a problem here. And so what I was thinking after listening to this part of the book is that what if, like, at some point, Enki's people – Got to Enoch, like he he realizes, like, wait a minute, this, cause, you know, this whole situation that I was told before is bullshit. Yeah, and all mankind is going to be destroyed, which means all of his descendants. Yeah, so he must have changed, switched sides eventually, and like he he knew about this deal that were, there was going to be this sort of crossbred yeah. hybrid, and that was the chosen person to. 
to save mankind from the from the flood. Yeah. So it's it, it doesn't make sense that Enoch like stayed on that same course the whole time, even though there's well, not really anything in the book that says that he didn't. Right. Well, like one thing I considered after we talked about this before, I was like, okay, maybe Enoch was never on that side. But dude, when, exactly. a, when a God tells you go to these people and tell them they're fucking pissing me off, like you don't say no, right? right? You go like he's like a glowing giant God, so you go and you do and what he's he all says. Powerful and all this, right? So you go and you're like, blah blah blah. He says you're doing the wrong thing, right? And and you're coming off as a bigoted old shaman, but really that's not what you want. But you can't not do it, right? So it's like that's exactly what I'm thinking. It's like later he he's actually making secret plans, right? He gets in with in- Inky. Some like Inky finds out that Enlil's using him for everything. So in- Inky is of course going to be interested in this guy, right? And it, and then word would be coming back to him from his people, like this dude yeah. just showed up and he was all blah blah blah. blah right. In- so like Inky would eventually make contact with with Enoch, I right. think. You know, and then yeah, and then Enoch would be like, "Thank God," because like. Fuck. So this is why this is why I think, and and I don't think that the idea of the pillars of Enoch is in Enoch's book, right? But I think that it's possible that they picked him up. To make him a scribe, to like make him the basically feed him a bunch of propaganda to yeah. go spread it yeah. among men and just tell them all this crap to make him like here, oh, we're going to teach you astronomy, we're going to teach you some other stuff, but don't mess with metals and don't mess with medicine or anything. Yeah. Go tell all these people exactly what we tell you to tell them. Write it all down. Yeah. So he starts doing their bidding, but he because they taught him something, they taught right. him language. He starts reading and starts learning other shit. Yeah. And he starts figuring out like, dude, this is. This is fucked up. Yeah, like, what's, what's wrong with this digging up metal? Like, what's wrong with that? Right, that's that's kind of my <laughs> idea, and that that's one of the things I would really like to talk to to the the author of this, Adam, is it Andy, Adam? And, yeah. Andy McCracken, Andy. McCracken. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of talking about the Kraken <laughs> because, dude, that you that from part the Kraken, of the bro? story, that part of like the you know the Sumerian uh, myths or whatever, quote unquote myths, <laughs> is myth uh, just means. Story, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's really interesting, but yeah, uh, like I think the, the idea of the pillars of Enoch again is something that hap- it's it's sort of like it's 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 legend building after he's gone, right? Yeah, like they call them the pillars of Enoch because Enoch has come to symbolize all this human knowledge because he got it from the gods, and yeah. You know, and then like uh, I also think we don't have everything that he wrote because this book is oh, yeah, no, is like th- basically like a a version that was copied and taken to Ethiopia, yeah, from some some older texts, right. right, and probably translated, yeah, because we don't know what language they were writing in. Well, we have we like, have like the Watchers. Oh yeah, no, no, but we have. Um, oh, hold on, the gate is calling me. That means the show observer is here. I just let him in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I saw that. Uh, we have the apocryphal texts in the the the, the two places where they found all that. One of them is called the um, the, what is the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the other one I can never pronounce it. The Nag Hammurabi, whatever library. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in those in those collections, one of them contained original Enoch Enoch Enochian texts, right? Mm-hmm. So. For a long time, it was considered that the the book the Ethiopians had was not a real biblical. That people just didn't believe that that was a real biblical text, right? But now that we found them in these ancient in these groupings of ancient texts where we know they're all really old and they were stashed there by people who then were killed, you know. So now it's so it makes the, that's why the Ethiopic version is like the best because it was the most well preserved. <clears throat> right, it was most well preserved, <clears throat> and they, and they, and they yeah. So there's the there's the argument that like, well, it's we don't know how many times it's been translated because they've had it forever. Whereas the what we see from the Dead Sea Scrolls has never been translated. It's the it's written in the original, you know, or maybe it was just copied. It's a copy of one of the originals, but so there's less translations in between now and the, right. you know, but still like they. I think it's in one of those versions because I was the the first time I ever read. Some of the Book of Enoch was not the, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian yeah. version. It was because I saw that and I was like, "What is that? What, what are the Ethiopians?" And I, yeah, so yeah. I, I read the other ones in on, on uh, sacredtext.com, and in those is when he's describing how they took him up and he saw the curvature of the world, yeah. of the earth. He sees that the 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 blanket. He describes it like, as like a like a quilt or yeah. whatever. Yeah, and then they he. It, it seems like he's describing them, taking him and showing him different planets. Yeah. And then, like, they, they flew him to, like, these far-off lands and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that was in the old versions, folks. 
Like, yeah. <laughs> that's in the, the, the non-translated, you know, old versions. It's, like, directly being translated from the those ancient. Are, those are really weird, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, tries to, he tries to appeal for one of the... One of the angels is being tortured in the prison in oh, one yeah. of those books, too. Yeah. And they're just like, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, he's going to be tortured forever. Yeah. 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 Real nice people, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, and, and you kind of get the idea, if I did anyway, that the Watchers are not the same necessarily, or maybe they're at different ranks or something. Like the Watchers are set aside, and Sitchin did this too. He's, he's viewed the Watchers as being different from these other groups. Right. The, so the, the Most High, like that guy, his whole face was like so bright yeah, on, that you couldn't even look at him. Yeah. It was blinding right. to, to look at him. And then the, the, the Watchers, the angels were not. Yeah. They were so their bright. Their skin was light and their eyes glowed and yeah. stuff. And but like, then there were then there are the cherubim and like yeah, all these and the seraphim okay, and the, I got the idea that the cherubim were like robots. Yeah, they're like little robots or whatever because yeah. they like there are certain cherubim that just do like this one task over and over and over and over. Right, and, over. The, and and like when you look at the old carvings, the things standing on, on the, guarding the gates, the, the you know the bird yeah. guys or whatever, those are cherubim. Those are yeah, you know, so like they could be huge and like it was a cherubim that was set to guard the the gate to the Garden of Eden. And in like the. I guess the Renaissance type paintings, the cherubim are all the little naked babies. Yeah, I know. It's like, what? <laughs> How do they become naked babies from giant bird things with lasers? <laughs> yeah. What does it deal with the babies? But of course, I saw that, that I did read something that was saying that the, the they look like the, 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 the Renaissance people would paint them as, as being infants, but they were enormous. Like the idea was that they, it was, it was a, a, like looked like a baby, but it was like huge, right? If you ever saw somebody next to it they they consider yeah. them to be babies but they were enormous like yeah. that would be pretty scary like a well, giant well that sounds like baby. sort of like a, a robot yeah you know? it's like you could just make them whatever but i mean right. like think about ai for example like oh, ai is like, like always a child yeah yeah that's true and single minded yeah like babies are you know feed me mm-hmm. sleep shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> They're either screaming or they're sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> or both. Right. That's right. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, though, to listen to you talk about the, the Book of Enoch. And, I, and, of course, like I said, I've been reading the Velikovsky heresies, and I'm thinking of all this stuff that correlates. And, and Velikovsky did set out to – one of the things that pissed off the scientific community so much about what he did was he was basically saying, like, look at all these biblical legends. Yeah. And then look at all these – he did comparative mythology, right? All over right. the world he finds all these – and he's like, these are common. These are these are similar, right? And then he shows you how – he basically uses all that – this is what pissed him off. He uses all this what, – what science considers to basically be fairy tales to come up with a brand new – a th- a astronomical theory of the formation of the solar system or, or yeah. to what we see today, right? right? He's like, you guys have all these anomalies that you can't explain. Well, look at all these myths. They explain it perfectly, right? Yeah. And that just pissed off the scientific community so much, dude. Uh, but that's kind of like, I love that. And that's kind of what I'm, my goal is too, is like, I want to, I want to read all these. the scientific community. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to read all these texts and like, I, I want to think about them in, in like that mindset, like not, I don't want to limit the the technology that that they might have had, right? That that might have existed, yeah, at the time. Like if you if you automatically assume butt flap, then in all of these ancient texts are really difficult to understand. Yeah. But if you if you get rid of that assumption, right, and say, well, I'm not going to like arbitrarily out, apply, right? Yeah. Arbitrarily like out rule out high technology, yeah, and then. Him being led into a crystal room with tongues of fire st- sticking out of the walls and the ceiling. Yeah. I'm like, glass and artificial light. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I mean, a, what, what the light bulb sticking out of my ceiling right now would be described as a, ton- as a, a snake, a serpent of fire, because it's one of those little freaking spaghetti light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. Right? If, yeah. if some ancient butt flap dude came in here, he'd be like, there's a serpent of fire on your ceiling. Right. Exactly. Like, yeah, it's, a, it's called a light bulb. And then he wouldn't have a word for that. Yeah. And like, in his language, I come outside wearing a headlamp. And I'm a cyclops with a glowing eye, right? You yeah. Because that's all you see is like this this dark figure with this glowing eye. Which is th- – that's the thing too is that like this is so Enlil style to yeah. like take somebody who's just a freaking sheep herder somewhere who's never seen anything right. and just like scoop them up in all this p- glory and p- fire and all this crazy shit and just take them Blow on their into minds. a completely different world. Yeah. And then 
put on the biggest, brightest headlamp you have and say, okay, bring him into the room. And yeah. you're like, just try to talk <laughs> to him blind while you're him. blinding him with the light. <laughs> and like, you got a microphone and shit and you're yeah. like, blah, blah. Yeah, that's right. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You will be my scribe. You cannot look at my face. <laughs> yeah. That's okay, the, now take him out of the room. It's the God Gambit. Right? It's the Wizard of Oz, dude. Yeah. Like, it's straight up. So it's it's just like in Lil's style to do that with somebody and then make them a scribe and then t- like just totally brainwash them with yeah. all this power and awe yeah. and then send them down to tell the story that he wants them to tell. Right. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what happened. If you read the book of Revelation, that's exactly what that looks like. Yeah. And and when you if you read that really carefully, you realize that everything that he sees, is they're actually showing it to him. Like he, he describes it as being a, on a scroll or something, but the images yeah. move. And I'm like, okay, so they're showing him a screen. They're like, look, all this stuff is going to happen in the future. You're seeing all this, sh- write down what you right. see. And he writes it down as though he was there, but he was actually viewing it on a some kind of, you know. Yeah. It's very, it's, and it's like, it's the and same if they deal. give him a little bit of psychedelics and they do it, then right. it's like even that much more powerful. Right. They're just like, oh my mind, God. Right? Yeah. And like they pulled him out of prison. You know, where he's been languishing in a prison for all this time. And then, like, they give him some psycho- psychedelic drugs and then show him a fucking view screen. It's going to blow his mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it is t- it's very typical of the of the Enlil way. Like, the, the the visions of Fatima, those three children that did that, they were they were like that. They're, pe- you know, peasants is the wrong word. But they were very poor, you know, mm-hmm. not, not educated. Uh, the guy who was was... Who had the the vision of Guadalupe, right? The, yeah. the the vision of Mary that showed up and told him to go to the go to the bishop right. and get the church. It was the same deal. Like didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write. It was a peasant, yeah. uneducated. It happens over and over and over. They're picking those people on purpose. You know why do they always appear to weirdos? You know it's like yeah. it's the same. It's like yes, they're picking them on purpose because they're uneducated, because they want to make an impression. Right, yeah. they want somebody easy to brainwash. They don't want to. Why like in the <laughs> in the new Star Trek series, right? The yeah, yeah. There's the one where they they're on this planet and they're all running, and there's this this group of of some of the indigenous population or whatever that are following. They've got all these weird spears and they have weird, <laughs> you know, and they run and they get on the freaking the Starship Enterprise just comes out of the ocean. Yeah, and they're like, oh, and they all start like bowing down. So it's like it's against their policy to show themselves yeah. to to these people because it will. It totally changes everything. Yeah, right. It changes everything, and it's like the prime directive is what that's called. Yeah. So that that's like so Enlil is violating the prime directive over and over and over and over and over <laughs> that's and over. Right. Yeah. Well, Enki did too, but he was like, let's bring him into the fold completely. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's show him the technology and show them that you can do this. This is science. Yeah. Enlil's way was like, don't show him any of the science. That knowledge is forbidden only to show, them. Yeah. Only showing the science to blow their minds. Right. Yeah. To make them your quote unquote prophet. Right. And right. it's not. He's not even really showing them the science. He's showing them the results of science. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it's it's one is deeply deeply manipulative. The other one is like. No, let's like let's bring him in with us and like right. see what they've got. You know, like he did that with Adapa. Like he took him everywhere with him. You know, yeah. And then like Adapa gets invited to go to the, the house of millions of years, whatever, to go up to heaven. And, and, and Inky's like, okay, dude, like I can't, t- I can't make you not go, but I don't think you should go. But you have to go. But when you go there, be careful of this and this and this and all. You know, he, yeah. Because he, he's afraid that they're going to do the same shit to Adapa that they've done to all these other humans. You know, so he tells him, don't eat anything, don't drink anything. And he knowing that that's going to offend Anu, like Anu offers him food and, and, and Adapa's like, no, right? Because right, he doesn't to, want him to get drugged. Yeah, he doesn't want him to get <laughs> and drugged. And then shown some propaganda. And then Anu tells him, if you would have eaten it, you would have been immortal. So, of course, Adapa goes back pissed off at Inky. Right. And Inky's like, uh, no, that's not what would have happened. You know, like yeah. it wouldn't have made you a god. Like, but yeah, there, there's you could see all that shit in, the, in those rivalries. Um but yeah, I keep I keep thinking about this Velikovsky stuff and uh, his his idea about um, about the, the about these cataclysms or whatever. It makes sense when you think of it in terms of like uh, so we have all these myths, right? Like the the the, the uh, Pallas Athena or Venus being birthed from the, the the head of Jupiter, yeah, or or Zeus. That's you know the, the Greek version or whatever. That's a weird story. Like no other god does that right the, the whole all the gods are in place and present in their stories where they, they they go back into the most ancient times right even though the newest pantheon who had defeated the chronos that the titans you know those guys had defeated the original ones they're still considered to be there for a long long time like the mm-hmm. greeks you know but athena actually shows up in their time like she's not there before that and then she shows up right and this is one of the things that velikovsky says is like this is you know, and if you and like you were saying, gods are planets, right? Yeah, or just 
heavenly bodies, right? Right. They're, so Venus is not in any texts previous to this certain period. Like Velikovsky went and looked for this, right? And he's like, there's no, there's no Venus. Okay. But there is Metis, who is the Greek mother of Venus. But she is consumed by Zeus before Venus is born. Hmm. And that is kind of like the Sumerian story right. of, of Tiamat, right? Tiamat and Tiamat and Marduk. Marduk. Yeah. Or, or not Marduk, uh, Nibiru. Yeah, it became Marduk from the Babylonians. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's weird how that, that works out. And like, so Velikovsky is basically like, well, if Metis was a, and it says that uh, Metis, Venus's mother, was, um, she was fertile. She was pregnant with Venus. And then she gets eaten by Zeus, and then Venus is birthed from his head, right? And you're like, what? <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? He's like, help. And then she's like, Bleak, comes out of his forehead. And that's a weird image. But if you think of it in terms of gods or planets, then you say, okay, so something cataclysmic happened. Mm-hmm. But then, so he goes through all these myths, and, and he shows it like the Book of Jubilees. It's weird, right? And it's got this 52-year period. Of, a jubilee is a 52-year period. Right. Right? Where... The, in Jewish law, <clears throat> at the time, in Jewish law, they had this deal where when the, when the Jubilee was coming up, when the end of the Jubilee was coming up, all debts were forgiven. All, uh, 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 all uh, like if you were renting a place, you had to leave. Like everything was reset to zero. Yeah. Right? Everything was reset to zero. And they would do this before, like right up to the end of the – like so the, the Jubilee end is coming up and everybody would do this. They would reset everything in their culture. Okay? And then there was this three-day waiting period where they all were kind of like breathless and waiting to see if the world would be destroyed. And if it wasn't, they would have this enormous jubilee, this gigantic celebration that it wasn't destroyed. So it's like you can kind of see like, okay, why are they doing that? Because something every 52 years was wiping culture out and w- erasing everything to zero. And so they started doing it on purpose to, to, to beg the gods to not – like they're, they're like, if this is what you want, we'll do it. Stop killing all of us, right? So every 52 years, they would er- in their culture, they would erase everything and make it all go back to zero like it would have if they would have been destroyed, but nobody dies. Dude, that's crazy. So that's making me think like 52. What do I know about 52? 52, 52, 52, 52 weeks in a cards. year. Cards. Yeah. And 52 <laughs> cards. In, yeah. 52 <laughs> weeks in a year, 52 cards in a deck. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 52 weeks in a year. 52 cards in a deck. And yeah. And like makes me think of the tarot and like the whole path of the fool. Yes. Yeah. And it's like all the... It's like the, all of those things come from like ancient Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the the symbolism in ancient Egypt. Yeah. And then like the path of the fool has like these these areas of like destruction and then renewal and all this kind of shit. Yes, that's right. And I think 52 is also like if you take half of 72 and then half of that and then add them together, I think, I think you get 52. I'm not sure. I could be wrong on that one. <laughs> half of 72, which is 46. 36. No. What? Is it 36? Yeah, 36. 36, yeah. And then you have that again, which is 50, 16. I don't know. I could be wrong. 36 plus 16 is 18. 18 and, and 36. Oh, okay. Right? I don't know. I didn't do the math. <laughs> Forward slash did not do the math. <laughs> well, I'm just going to double check the math here. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so there's the weird thing with the Jubilees, and there's the Book of Jubilees, which is an apocryphal text, okay? It's, it, it describes all this stuff. Um. Uh, the book of Jasher also like in the actual canonical Bible, the book of Jasher and the book of Jubilees are mentioned. They're cited, you know, uh, and they found them with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But yeah, so that the whole thing with the Jubilee is weird, but it, it 54, 54, yeah. which is right. That's like, if you, we, when you include the two jokers in your deck card, you have 54 cards. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> nice. Snake to that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like, that re- that implies some kind of recurring – I mean, think about that. Like, a cataclysm that wiped everything out every 52 years? Like, f- fuck. Okay. So, uh, and like we were saying before, Copernicus and all these – and, like, the further back in time you go, if you look at these otherwise well-respected astronomers that were making all these measurements and you go, like, China and everything, like these people thousands of years ago who otherwise made enormously meticulous – records of of movements in the sky mm-hmm. uh that that agrees with all of our all of our records or whatever but then you look at what they said about venus and they're just way off right and they're just like people are like okay they, 
they were totally wrong. And they, they tried to say, well, it was his copying errors, comp, you know, compounding copying errors. Like every time a scribe copied the Venus parts, he would get something wrong. And then the next guy would get more things wrong. And then it, until it was just. Maybe it was the Mandela effect. <laughs> <laughs> they just all remembered it wrong one day. Yeah. There's also a problem with the. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way. That's right. In the same way. And then <laughs> later on, they did that again and it got worse. Uh, there's also a problem with the eclipses, right? So the, the, there's. There's records of eclipses going back, right, thousands and thousands of years. They found records for, you know, where people were recording an eclipse happened, like a total full solar eclipse happened on this day, right? Well, you reach the – okay, so the same period where everybody changed their calendars, that is the demarcation of where – Previous to that, none of the eclipses that were recorded line up with what we what we are like. If we to. reverse the process, yeah, and like go we're back. going backwards, they stop lining up, right? And that, like, and Laird's okay, that's when it was three hundred sixty day a year. That's right. Laird Scranton and Velikovsky point out that like the reason this happened is because previous to that, the years were the, like we're doing it wrong. But that makes sense period. that if it, if we get a new planet that shows up, that's put in position in our solar system, yeah, all the rest of the planetary. You know, the, there's a big adjustments that have to be made. Yeah, all the adjustments have to be made. But because also, of that. but also, Venus made an enormously close pass to Earth, and like Velikovsky thinks that, you know, based on everything that he found, and I don't have all the data, but bas- he basically implies that like so Venus didn't it didn't impact, but it came so close that it effectively like, it, like so what people think of the pole shift is just Venus passing by and knocking Earth de- over sideways. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, so it basically like earth was maybe closer to being almost straight up and down in terms of, of its axis. Venus comes by and like knocks it over 30, you know, 20 degrees or something like that and gives it the wobble. Now it's wobbling and shit like that. It's, and so, and this also kind of, this also sort of like goes along with these ideas standing from ancient times that everything's out of kilter, that stuff is not in alignment anymore, that we're in this age where everything is not divine. It's no longer part of the divine plan. It's been knocked. Yeah. Uh, you know, so everything is like, uh, not, they would say illusion, but, but they, but they were saying basically that we have this enormous debt of evil, evil being not godlike, not part of the original plan of the universe. Mm-hmm. Right. And we're all being affected by it all the time. Like we are no longer in harmony with the universe because something came by and, and fucking, you know, like almost killed everything, but left us tilted and like cracked and broken hmm. in terms of the harmony of the universe. And so Earth is disharmonious, right? And Mars, like Mars was, Mars does go back in the records as far as you can see, but <laughs> it was never considered until after this period that Velikovsky p- is pointing out, it was never considered to be dangerous. Well, it became the god of war after this period, like the psychotic god of war Ares, right? Mars mm-hmm. became Aries, like the, like the, because if you think about it, like Athena is a, a goddess of war and love, right, or whatever, and she's like really tactical and like she's got, she's brilliant or whatever, but Mars is like just psycho. He's, you know, he's like, he, he's, he's a uh, indiscriminate destruction, you know, uh, like depicted as crazy, like the, the, like all the bad things about war is Mars. But he wasn't like that until this period, and then after that, he was he becomes this just like agent of destruction, indiscriminate destruction, like and revels in it, right? So Velikovsky is saying that like Venus also made a close pass to Mars. That's why Mars is missing half of its freaking crust on one side because he says that it not a close pass, it actually hit, it impacted. So, uh, uh, the Electric Universe guy Wall Thornhill, yeah. Uh, actually did a lot of work with Vilikovsky. Yeah, yeah. And they, apparently he, he got, you know, he, he started working on the electric universe idea and then. And Vilikovsky was into that too. Right, right. Yeah. But he pointed out to some of the, like he, he doesn't think the collisions are even possible. Right, right. Yeah. That it's because they, they, because the. But the energy the electric, of the collision would still be there. It would just, it would just take right, place. Right, right. It would yeah. take place in electrical. Yeah. Discharges. Uh, discharges like, so it's yeah. like Venus would be shunted away from Mars because right. of electric, but the, but the that energy, huge freaking gash on the yeah on, yeah it's like, yeah that that's, enormous that's canyon. A light, it's a lightning sky <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a wall, wall. But, <laughs> right but Mars does have what's called the it's called the oh, I can't remember but it's basically the, it's a wall right it's a wall that goes all the way around it it's not like on the equator it's tilted but there's this like thousand or maybe it's a mile. It's like, it's a really high freaking straight up cliff wall. that goes like it, it circumnavigates the entire planet. 
And that basically implies that like on one side of it, a, a huge amount of its crust just got blown off of it. Yeah. Okay. So the, the only thing that, that, that could possibly do that is an enormous impact with a body of almost the same size, which is yeah. Mars and Venus, right? So if the, if, like, the energy of the impact doesn't have to be directly from the planet, because that doesn't make sense. because Earth was caught in the middle, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so Venus makes a close pass to Earth, according to Velikovsky, and like knocks us out of kilter. But after, after Venus and Mars have their encounter, now Mars is getting is com- like Mars and Earth are, are like having these multiple. This is the Jubilees. Every 52 years, they're having this conjunction oh. that, that is close as fuck and it's causing all this messed up shit. Well, over time, it, it's not as close and not as close, right? But they would see it getting enormous and red in the sky and they'd be like, oh my God, you know, the God of War. Uh, but Mars was not a comet. They all knew it was a planet, but, the, but they thought Venus was a comet. They called it the bearded. They, they, they said that it had a, a beard or a, uh, a tail, you know. Yeah. Um, but it normalized itself and stopped being dangerous. Uh, but Mars like was totally normal and then suddenly became dangerous and psychotic. And like for, you know, they they had these, these constant interactions with it and we still have this. This is the weird thing. Both with, okay. Earth with Mars and with Venus have these conjunctive periods. And with Venus, it's really strange because, Every time they're in, uh, is it aphelion? I can never remember if it's perhelion or aphelion when they're at the closest to each other, the closest approach. When Venus and Earth have their closest approach, every fucking time, they are tidally locked. The same sides of the planets always are facing each other when they have their closest approach, which implies that they had a long time ago a really close approach that tidally locked them into that. Oh, my God. That's badass, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's that's sh- when I read that I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we need to take another break and uh show observer is going to is here. I think he's outside. Um so we're going to take a break and then when we come back we should, we should have him in the studio with us. Yeah. So we will be back with Snake. our pyramids tied behind our backs just to make it square <laughs> this is brothers of the serpent podcast coming to you for the second hour and we have the uh, official show observer now officially observing the show in studio in house that's right making the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube into a round table somehow <laughs> not really sure how that works <laughs> um, so we've been talking about Enoch and Velikovsky clearly the same guy Uh, (laughs) (laughs) obvious connection that's right (laughs) the pillars of Velikovsky but yeah I have this um, I have this interesting part from the book from Larry Scranton which is again it's called the Velikovsky Heresies I was going to go through this real quick it's just really interesting how he says this so he says another likely reason for the intensity of the reaction to worlds in collision was that the book uh, committed what amounted to an inexcusable faux pas in 1950. Both its thesis and its author brazenly dared to cross the invisible boundaries that are traditionally observed between a number of different academic disciplines. In doing so, Velikovsky may have thrown many scholars within those disciplines off balance by essentially challenging many of their key assumptions on the basis of evidence that was drawn from fields other than their own. (laughs) Astronomers of the day were not accustomed to having to give account for themselves or their theories to historians. Nor were, nor were they inclined to accept fragmentary testimony or ancient references that had been obscured by the sands of time and framed in some archaic language on the same footing as traditional empirical scientific evidence. Consequently, few ha- may have known quite how to respond to what they saw as an un- unorthodox attack on their field of study or felt up to the more challenging task of trying to definitively refute Velikovsky's broader theory, portions of which may have fallen outside of their own field. In Worlds in Collision at its simplest, Velikovsky posited, based on statements and observations extracted from written texts, myths, words, and engraved artifacts of ancient cultures from around the globe, that contrary to prevailing scientific belief, the planet Venus, which is thought by traditional scientists to be billions of years old, 
must be a relatively recent addition to our pl family of planets. Furthermore, he proposed that Venus had made its first appearance in our solar system a mere 3,500 years ago, around 1500 BCE, and then behaved not as we would expect a planet to behave, but rather like a brilliant comet. Venus was described by several ancient cultures as having a long tail or beard and was said to have brightened the entire heavens, moving erratically across the sky and creating havoc for centuries prior to settling down into its familiar role as one of the most orderly planets in the solar system. Furthermore, it was, it was Velikovsky's personal contention that the movements of this comet could explain and might ultimately provide a historical basis for many of the seemingly miraculous events of the Bible reported to have occurred at the time of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. No wonder that this would seem to the average scientist of the day as a frontal assault on science and as a wholesale attempt to reassert what he or she saw as an outmoded religious paradigm, one that the scientific community had worked diligently for decades or even centuries to supplant. Oh, yeah. So that's why they flipped out. Way to piss them off, bro. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again. Yeah. Where, where's the next guy? <clears throat> but yeah, this is a great book. Uh, he got Basically, the premise of the book uh, that Larry Grant wrote, The Velikovsky Heresies, is he's like, he writes it, it's fairly recent. I think it's like 2012, 2014, something like that. And he's basically like, okay, so Velikovsky was 1950. Worlds in Collision was 1950. Like, we have a lot of scientific data that was not available at the time or during the entire, quote unquote, Velikovsky affair, uh, which went into the 80s with Carl Sagan and shit. We have a lot of data that was not available to them at the time. And he's like, so I, I propose to look at this new scientific data and look at Velikovsky's old thing and see, like, was he, you know, because because there are points like Velikovsky, at least. <clears throat> first of all, he was a trained scientist. OK, he was not a non-scientist or a layman or whatever, like Sitchin. You know, they always say Sitchin wasn't a scientist. Well, Velikovsky was trained. And, uh, you know, he was a scientist um, I mean, psychology and stuff like that. So they would say soft science or whatever. But still, he was a trained scientist. He understood the, the methodology. Mm -hmm. And when he proposed his theory, he did what most scientists don't do anymore, which is give you uh, the, the falsification. Like, if this is found to be true, then everything I said is wrong. Right. And he did that like multiple times. And like, <clears throat> so Scranton is going through there like, here are these here are these really pivotal points in his theory where if we can say that. If we can find any data that says that that isn't possible, the whole thing is dropped. And he goes through the entire book and doesn't find anything. Like he's like, like no, this actually, you know, points to it being possible. Like he goes through the whole thing with Venus. You know, there's nothing about Venus that we know with all the data that we have now, with all the orbiters we've sent and everything like that, that says that it couldn't be what he said it was. And actually, most of it points to it probably being what he said it was. You know how we've gone through? <clears throat> one of the things we we do on this show is point out how we're always fucking wrong about everything all the time, like mainstream science, yeah. right? Like, like it annoys me when people are taking like the scientific model of something. Like I had, I was having this discussion over the, the remote viewing of Mars. Remember that I read the whole, the yeah. guy remote viewed Mars. There was this discussion online where the guy was like, that, that's impossible. Like, and he starts telling everybody how Mars was a billion years ago. And I'm like, well, that's, that's based on, a, the, the current scientific model and like the only thing we know empirically about Mars is everything they thought about it is wrong right <laughs> so you're taking the stuff that hasn't been looked at yet and saying that it's still true right in other words we haven't been able to look at those things to see if they're right or wrong yet but everything else that we have been able to look at has been surprising and shown that what right. we thought was wrong And but you're saying but everything else we, we haven't confirmed yet would just consider it to be true that's right. bullshit right yeah, exactly. we should actually consider the model to be completely wrong and like most of science shows that what we think about things before we actually are able to go look at it empirically is fucking wrong. Like, yeah, you know, 99.99% of the time. <clears throat> so evidence based science is hard. <laughs> <clears throat> it's hard if you, yeah, <laughs> if you have built a whole career and everything on, on conjecture and stacks of assumptions, right. Of this model that you've built. And then when somebody goes and actually gets empirical data and then shows that all of that's wrong, that's, that's hard for a lot of people. They don't like that. I always look at it as like spending a lot of time making a badass paper airplane and then you go to throw it and it just drops straight into the ground. <laughs> and then you're just in denial. That didn't yeah, happen. That didn't happen. My model is badass. Yeah, just my hang it up. Awesome. I'm just going to hang it up like an in flight. There's a ceiling right. fan on. Somebody turn that fan off. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, so so like Velikovsky's ideas are not he doesn't do that. He doesn't he doesn't like he doesn't take all these scientific conventions and and assumes they're correct. Right. He looks instead at all this actual evidence. It may be not empirical, but it is empirical for the people who recorded it. Right. Right. That's the thing is like they're like, well, those are that's myth and legend. I'm like, but that's also a model that you have made. Right. Yeah. Current science has made a model 
of all this ancient wisdom and called it mythology and made up fairy tale bullshit. That's their model of it. They don't have any empirical evidence that that is true. Right. Whereas the people who are writing those myths, quote unquote legends and all that shit, were saying this is empirical shit. We saw this happening in the sky. Right. So current science model of that shit is that it's not empirical and it's there's no empirical data for that. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> and the crazy the crazy thing about that is that they'll give complete, you know, credence and applause to all their other astronomy. Like it's amazing how well they were able to chart the stars and right, but, things and know things, but these things yeah. are absolute nonsense because butt flaps make you lie. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> butt flaps make you lie. Well, there's also like the the issue of they're constantly surprised at how well they did stuff, right? Like there's there's yes. this there's this sort of constant like sort of wide eyed surprise at how amazing the astronomy of the ancients was, and we're like I'm like why are you still amazed by this? Like there is no ancient culture that we found that built anything that was not fucking badass at astronomy, or at least had some elements of it that were badass at it, you know? Yeah. That seemed to have amazing astronomical data that we don't even know where it came from. Like even now we have. There are, there are tribes that don't do any astronomy. They live in the fucking jungle. They can't see the stars. But they have this astronomical information from their distant past yeah, like that's that, like anomalous. Was that – we reported on that artifact they found that had like trigonometry tables like written on it or whatever, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> from like Sumer or something. Yeah. And they're like, nah. <laughs> nah. That's right. They, that they found out that those guys were doing trigonometry, that which, which made them able to do the spherical trigonometry right. to be able to map the world, which right. they thought was not even possible until much more recently. Right. Yeah. Yeah, to be able to do the projections. And the, yeah. yeah, and the, the table that was written or whatever, whatever it was, because I, I don't know that shit, but whatever it was, it was like more accurate. That's right. Like, yeah. then, then like, this is actually a better formula than our modern yeah. day shit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, the way that they were, the way that they were figuring it all out and shit, they were like, "Holy shit, this is kind of better." than Actually, ours. no, it wasn't better than ours today. It was better than like like eighteen fifty, yeah. something like that. Yeah, better than all the way up to yeah, very recently. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's interesting. Now I don't have the research to back this up, but neither do they. And they say shit all the <laughs> so, time. yeah, it's fine. You can say it. But as far as I know, and it, I'm sure I'd hear about it. We have yet to find math from the ancient world and gone. Well, they had that wrong. Right. Like it's always right. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a, what? Except for the cubit. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, their math on that was always good. It's the, it's the, <laughs> the right. length. They yeah. can't figure it out. <laughs> right. That's right. It's like, it's, it's, like, a, it's a ratio, guys. <laughs> no. Like, they have all the, the, well, they don't have a lot of them, but the, the sticks, you know, the, the sticks that they call cubits, because they think of it as like, well, where's their, where's their measuring stick? You don't need a measuring stick if it's a ratio. Like, you were the one that pointed this out to me because I was like, yeah. well, you know, the cubits are like varying lengths. And like, you look at the hash marks that they have on them, they're like, like that's not even. Right. You know? <laughs> You're like, well, it's a ratio. It doesn't matter. Like, you could just arbitrarily make one to give you demarcations for the ratio. You know, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. You don't have to have a, like, because we have all these standards of, me of measure. Right. Right. We have these things that are like sitting in these freaking vaults and, you know, floating in magnetic fields to make them never change or whatever. Like, to this is how much a gram is and this is how, much, how long this is. Right. They didn't but if, do you had, if you had the, so I've been, I made this set of blocks for Soul. Yeah. Right? Yeah. My son. And, and uh, the I was, way I cut them is the, the golden ratio. Yeah. Right. The, the rectangular side of it is the golden ratio. Yeah. And so if you build, if you build something out of it, like lining them up straight, right? Where yeah. they make a rectangle, they'll make the golden ratio again, yeah. Again, right? Five by three or yeah. whatever. And so then you can hold one of the blocks in your hand and super stand it. over it. Yeah. Stand over the large rectangle you made on the floor and bring that block closer to your eye until it perfectly fills yeah. the rectangle on perfectly the floor. Perfectly occults it, yeah. Right? So it gives you that sense of proportion. And then you could basically say from there that the distance from your eye to the block and then the distance from the from the surface of the block down to the, yeah, the rectangle on the floor ratio. is the golden ratio. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter like what length your cubit stick is as long as it has all the ratios on it. Right. That's what because I was saying. Because you could stand back and move it to your eye and see – that what you're building is the proper freaking proportions. Yeah, I remember we were figuring out this about the pyramid. You're like, wait, if I, so if I bring a model, yeah, exactly, the pyramid, and I, I hold it out 
then I'll be able to tell that I'm 10 miles away. Like, yeah. Yeah, if it was the scale, <laughs> right. That yeah. was, I was just like, holy shit, that's badass. <laughs> like, if I know what the scale of my model is, yeah. then I can tell how far away from the pyramid is by measuring how far away my little pyramid is it's from my eye. eyeball. That's right. <laughs> it's freaking when awesome. It, when it is perfectly occulting the Great Pyramid out there, you're like, okay, that tells me how far away I am from the actual thing. <laughs> that's so very yeah. cool. <laughs> and I mean, it, it makes way more sense. Like, if you think about, you know, impossible blocks, like... You're gonna seriously go out and measure it like with a tape? Yeah. No, just compare yeah. them to each other. It's really hard, so especially when it's reference. Windy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have this problem all the time at work. We got, we want to measure something, and it's like, <sighs> yeah. And the tape is this giant curve. Get the measuring papyrus. That's right. <laughs> it's gonna blow in the wind and rip. <laughs> yeah. There's no way, dude. Right. Do we have get the thirteen acre measuring papyrus? Right, yeah. So we can get the side of this pyramid. Yeah. They yeah, just right. made slaves lay down head to toe. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one thousand four hundred and sixty two slaves long, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite right. <laughs> How do you yeah, but slaves come in lumps. Find a tall one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that whole thing comes from, like in elementary school, and they make you line up like tallest to shortest. Yeah, it's from ancient times. That's right. It's a measuring it's demarcation <laughs> of measuring. That's right. Ancient metrology. Yeah, yeah. They're all fourteen years old, <laughs> but we're going to stack them up in like <laughs> height. You got the nephes at the back, right? <laughs> I thought that was so you could wherever you were in line, you could always see the teacher. Because the people in front of you were shorter. Like, that's what I thought it was. It was that like, makes way too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> I was always at the back of the line, too, because I was, like, o- older than everybody. So I was always the- way too tall. So I got to look at everybody's heads all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, where were we? I don't know. Um, <laughs> measuring sticks. <clears throat> yeah, well. Rulers. The, you're a freaking yeah. ruler. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> supposed to measure stuff. Not Control Tyrannize people. Us. Yeah, tyranny. <laughs> I'm here to rule over you. No, it's supposed to measure things. <laughs> I remember the first time you told me that one. Like, yeah, I was like, I've never thought of that. Oh my god. Yeah, I know. That's Blow. like that happened to me too. That's why uh, they're carrying that freaking scepter? You know, yeah. it's got the globe on it, and yeah, got some it's ratios and fucking surveying instrument. <laughs> 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 the flail was to cut down the the bushes so they could. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that was the flags, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they put down, they stick the flags in the ground. It's the flail. <laughs> They're holding a shitload of flags. That's the flail. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. <laughs> Freaking survey surveyors, dude. He's got his surveying stick and his fucking flags. <laughs> I'm telling you, we'll man. put some pictures on the show notes so you guys can see what we're talking about. Yeah, we've been wrong for so long. It's ridiculous. <laughs> That's basically the point of this segment that we're fucking wrong about everything all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and I, I, this is interesting to me in a sort of a philosophical way, right? So, but, we, well, go ahead. No, sorry. <laughs> but, okay, Continue. like, why is that the case? Like, why? Are we always wrong? Like when we when we make suppositions, right? We look at is it is it is it the current um, is it the current age's worldview that is causing this? Is it our languages? But but why is it that like when we look at the world and we don't have empirical data, but we're like okay, we see things happening. Like we're like, well, what's ca- how's this happening? And we make up a model, but then we go and actually look scrutinize it. We're f- wrong in every possible way. Like why does know. that happen all the time? I don't know, but when I first figured out that we were wrong about everything, I've been proving it every day <laughs> since. <laughs> Might even be wrong about that. Yeah. <laughs> since, since, fuck. Tomorrow I'll be like, damn it. <laughs> yeah, didn't prove it that time. <laughs> Shit. It's not fucking wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Like, you know, because there's this, this Gnostic idea, and it's more than Gnostics, but like this, this concept of the universe as a, as a construct that is, uh, a teaching machine, right? And the Gnostics didn't really think that. They did think it was a construct. But, like, the, the, this whole thing about esoterica, right, it, it, sometimes it looks to me like th- that the idea for esoteric information actually comes from the structure of the universe and the way things work. It just comes from them because it seems like this information is occulted behind a behind something else that's that you can easily see, right? So, like, we look at something and we make up an idea about it. And when we, when we really scrutinize it and really get down into the details, you find out that your idea is not, not what's happening. But there's something much more interesting going on. 
that's esoterica in a, in a nutshell, right? Yeah. That the, 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 what you see on the surface is interesting enough for you to like to tell other people about it, but it isn't. Act, but when you really look at what's happening, the the what you see on the surface is, or your ideas about what you saw on the surface are completely wrong. But what's ha- really happening is far more fascinating than anything you came up with, right? Mm-hmm. Like that seems to be built into the structure of the universe. Like it's all it's almost like it's purposeful. Th- that's why I'm asking. Like, do you think that it, do you think there's some reason why we're well, I have a materialist reason. Okay. That is that we're made up of a bunch of sensors. Oh, and yeah. And like the sensors, like for, I'll just use light. Yeah. So when we look at the trees and all the plants growing green in the spring, we're like, oh, they're all green. <laughs> and if we, when we study it a little closer, we're like, actually, they're not green at all. They're right. reflecting green. Yeah. They're rejecting green. Yeah. <laughs> That's how we see them though. Yeah. So in a sense, they are green. Because that's how they're represented to us yeah. by the universe. The universe, right, like like in the, the light that's going through it, whatever frequencies are bouncing off of these things, show us the things. Hmm. But they're not the things themselves. Right. That's but they the, do represent what's inside the thing. So like the chlorophyll, the, yeah. the, the, all the scientists are like when they teach you in school, it's like, well, the chlorophyll, well, <laughs> yeah. that's a tree green. <laughs> right. And that's like, true. well, actually, sort of. it's sort of true. because yeah. Yeah, It makes cor- the tree green because it rejects the green color. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So there's a, the, just like in Esoterica, there are key bits of information that rewrite the entire picture. Right. So so looking out at the world without knowing anything about light and how it works or whatever, you would see things as that's gold, that's black, that's green, that's blue. Right. But then once you have this key piece of information that what you're actually seeing is is this stuff being reflected, okay, as, a, as opposed to being absorbed by these objects, then suddenly it reverses everything. And you're like, oh, like it's blue because it's not blue, right? It's blue because it rejects blue. Right. That That's what I'm talking so about. The, so it's like thinking of it deeper than it's like, well, what is blue? Blue is a frequency. So the thing is rejecting a frequency, which means what? That it... That frequency is not absorbed by the thing. Right. So that it does tell you something about the thing, that the thing resonates at other frequencies right. in the color spectrum so that it absorbs these other colors and rejects the blue so that you know that really inside it's resonating at the frequency of like the red and the. That's what know, I mean. That's why it's like esoterica. It's, the information is there, but it's hidden behind this key piece. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. This, this, you have to have. That's this. what my materials answer is, is that it's because we're made up of sensors that are picking up everything that everything's rejecting. Mm, OK. Right. Or if, if we had infrared sensors, what we do, our skin pretty yeah. much is an infrared sensor. Like we're, we're, we can pick up. Someone's body heat. Yeah. And that is actually emanating from them. Right. So in a sense, like, we are getting a real sense of what. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, 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 so some things are direct, right? Like like, like smells. Like that, that, that can be directly emitted by something. It's not a rejection, right? It's, it's coming from something or whatever. Right. It's being made by it. Like when you smell a flower, like those, those, those molecules are coming off of it because it's partially made of them. Right. right? But then, but, but alter the sensor and it appears totally different again. Yeah. So like when we build a scientific sensor, a scientific eye, it picks up shit that we'd never see. Right. right? So it's like, depends on, but building a scientific eye is in a sense becoming, it's stepping into the path of the initiate. Like you are endeavoring to have a deeper understanding of the things right. that you're experiencing. That's what I mean. Like, but it, it even goes deeper, right? Yeah. Like the more, the more complex the eyeball you, you build, the more crazy the information you're getting. You're <laughs> right. Like, what, <laughs> right. what the fuck is this? And mean? is that, and, and does that mean that like a, a more complex eye is not necessarily a more correct one? Like, cause sometimes the very simplest things like make everything clear. Yeah. So that, that was another, like kind of going back on, on my own point is like that the tree you could say is everything but green but then like maybe it maybe the green color the way we experience the green color really does say something about the tree itself that we can't see hmm. that we don't understand right i don't know okay yeah i think i think that <clears throat> i guess my broader point that i'm getting at is that it's never what it appears to be at first glance right and that is built into everything in the universe and you're so you're saying yeah and that's because of the way we're built but well, we're part of the universe like this in other words the whole design seems to be you see what i mean like in esoterica the design of the stuff is keeping in mind who is going to be experiencing it and how 
So you right. make it so that it's on on its first glance to those people who will be who will be experiencing it, they'll see something that isn't really what you're trying to convey. Right. But it's almost like like when you start looking into esoterica, like the way they design things is very much like it, it's as though those who designed the esoteric shit were scholars of the universe That's and what I how mean. the universe worked. And so they're looking at the way the universe is naturally and they're trying to reproduce it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I was uh, like, so like at the beginning of this, I was like, does it seem like the whole concept of esoteric traditions actually comes from the way the universe is? Like, Are you trying to say that I was arguing with you and now I'm telling <laughs> you your own point? Yeah. <laughs> How did this happen? <laughs> this like, is because fascinating to watch. This, this is what I started out I'm saying. Sorry. And now you're like, yeah, yeah, dude, let me explain this to you. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get, I, I wasn't following you initially. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that was, but I wasn't trying to argue. I was trying to. No, that's answer, great that you came answer. to that. Cause that's exactly what I was trying to say that I'm like, doesn't it seem kind of like that the, that the whole idea of esoteric knowledge comes from looking at the universe and realizing that it's built this way. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah, I think that's fucking awesome, right? Like, Hell yeah. I, I, would, thought- <clears throat> I would add that it seems philosophically that one of the biggest differences between modern society and what we perceive to know about esoterica is that we no longer have a general belief in our scholars of anything that is greater than our own knowledge. Yeah, we are no right. longer acceptant of a wise man realizes he knows nothing. Mm-hmm. We do not aspire to greater answers than the ones we already have. In that time, there was high spirituality. There was a God. There was a greater force. You accept that the things that you cannot explain may be explainable, but that because of the fact that they are beyond you, you have a whole different perspective on all of it. It's right. It's there's, almost, a, there's a sort of an awe right. because you're looking at it in terms of like, this was built by an intelligence, by something that meant to do it. And so like you, 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 your so entire approach this. to it is completely different. Let us build this temple in the image of God. <laughs> That's right. right. Like you're not trying to quantify it as much as you are to, to see it, to understand right. the yeah. way that it moves from point A to point B. Right. And, and, and in so doing, hopefully like the idea that I always see is that, that that in studying the universe, you are in a, in a sense attempting to understand the mind of God, right? That, like yeah. by by looking at something He built, and if He built everything, you're like, okay, so like by by doing this, you are you are like increasing your relationship with this whatever it was that built the universe, right? That this is the this is the endeavor, and so the the, the cathedrals, these things that where you walk in, you're just like, oh my God, and they just like make you weep. Yeah. Those are those were built. As a response to all this information they learned, and they're like, "Here, here's what we know about God, right? And right. They build this thing that when you walk in, you're just like, holy fuck. And that, that's, I think that's awesome. You and know? <laughs> this actually just kind of dawned Russ on me. Russ walks into a house of God and goes, <laughs> holy <laughs> fuck. <laughs> and is amazing. immediately thrown <laughs> out <laughs> on his ass. Holy fuck. But God wouldn't care. <laughs> yeah, the people in there would throw me out, but God wouldn't care. <laughs> so think of it this way, right? Like if you're looking at flowing water in a river – and you see the river and the water flowing, you get the idea to build a mill wheel, right? And so you've got this giant wheel that whoa, whoa, harnesses whoa, whoa, the whoa. power. What? <laughs> Two different conceptual approaches. If you're looking at the water and trying to... I'm just thinking about jumping in, like you come to a <laughs> mill wheel. I'm like, <laughs> Well, if you're trying to understand it, you're trying to prove that you are equal to God, you then start talking about the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules and all of this crap that is yeah. completely unnecessary Fluid to dynamics. put a wheel in it yeah. for the wheel to turn to Just take put a advantage wheel in it. of it. Yeah, okay, gotcha. But if your focus is on being able to recreate a river, you're going to completely lose it. Or your focus is like nothing understands this until we do right? because it's all dumb chance. And if anybody tries to do anything with it, well, they're stupid and it's not going to work. <laughs> like it, the mindset itself and the approach destroys – in some ways, like the ability to appreciate it, to, to do anything with it. Yeah. It's like we live in a world where we're all perfectionists, except for the ones who decided to stop because it was dumb. Well, yeah, the, the, there was a phrase that I can't remember it right now, but it basically has to do with the idea of a materialist world, like being bereft of spirit. Right. Right. It's, it is a, it is a, uh, I think, um, uh, Alex Sicaris, the guy who does Skeptico says this all the time that we, you know, we live meaningless lives in a meaningless universe. Like that's a, that's a, if you think about that for long enough, you start to realize how deeply uh, damaging that is, right? Like that if all this is just 
by chance, you know, that there's nothing behind it. And it all just, ha- then, then, then our lives are meaningless. Right. And then you have, but you go out, you go on the internet and look at any, like you can find millions of people seeking for meaning in, in, in their lives. And, you know, people that commit suicide are like, I don't have that. You know, there's no meaning in my life. I don't mean anything to anybody or whatever. Like you lose the meaning by saying that the universe is dumb and it has nothing behind it. And therefore we have nothing behind us. Right. If the universe is unconscious, this is the, this is called the hard question of consciousness. If the universe is ma- basically made up of unconscious matter, then we ourselves are actually unconscious because you can't get consciousness from something that isn't conscious. You can't take a bunch of tiny things that are not conscious and stack them all together and somehow arrive at consciousness, which is you can't do that. Right. <laughs> like or at least nobody has ever been able to, sh- to show how that could happen. Right. And like one thing that empirical science is supposed to do is to say, like, we don't we won't accept assumptions that have no provenance that, you know, like if you're going to say that uh, we're conscious because you can take a bunch of tiny things and stack them all together in a certain way and arrive at a conscious being, well, then you need to show how that's possible. And no one's been able to do it, which basically, but they've been t- maintained in this material, materialist worldview, which basically says that we are not actually conscious and we live in a meaningless universe and have, and our lives are meaningless and nothing has any meaning at all. And yet that's a they... devastating concept. It's, it's a terrible you know. Yeah, and yet they endeavor to explain the mechanisms where if it's all random, there is no explanation. Their entire attempt is paradoxical. Yeah. The explanation is pointless and meaningless. Right, because it was just – it randomly happens. Right. So why does it matter? Yeah. It doesn't matter if there's – It could have inspired like somebody though. It's like the universe has no meaning. There may be no I'm inspiration. Go find <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly their, their life has meaning. Yeah. I my, shall find the meaning. The meaning of, the of life is to find the meaning of life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, the, uh, like materialism should be dead. It should have been dead a long time ago. Like, the, the, you know, this, go, this goes back to, like, another thing that we talk about on this show a lot, which is, like, what is, this, what is the impetus behind some of these vast cultural things that are going on? What, what, what is causing us to hold on to this idea that is so obviously faulty, right? Like, wh- and, and, and not, only, not only faulty, but just terrible like it's not a fun idea it's not a good idea it's it's kind of an unpleasant concept that that everything is meaningless and anything you do it doesn't matter you know like you you're not anything greater than the 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 mush that's in your brain or whatever but there's it's like a trap because once you start teaching that to a society and then the society begins to just do whatever the fuck because nothing matters nothing matters then it's really hard to turn back Right, and to, and to suddenly say, wait, everything matters, and all that shit that I did when I thought nothing yeah. matters is going to pay for that later. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I I've said that because like there's this idea, there's this pretty common idea. If you go anywhere where a bunch of atheists gather, first of all, they're all pissed off all the time, and it's not fun. But if you you can see when they're talking, they that they they think that people who believe in any kind of life after death, spirituality, whatever. Dumb. Well, yeah, they think they're dumb, but they also think they're weak minded that and that they're af- they're terrified of the idea of, of permanent death of, of what, what were you calling it? Um, real death. Like, yeah. yeah, actually dying and like having not existing anymore. Right. And, I'm, and I just I, I always tell them, I'm like, no, I mean, like, yeah, that's an unpleasant idea. But oblivion is not going to be terrifying because I won't be there to, t- to experience it. I'll right. be oblivious. Right. Like I'll die and I'll be gone. Therefore. It's not really that scary. It's it's not it's not pleasant, but it yeah. isn't something that's terrifying. However, what is terrifying is somebody who thought that's what it was like, and then finds out it isn't, and that they're going to pay for everything they did when they thought that it wasn't like that. That's fucking terrifying. Yeah, right. Or it's it's ter- <laughs> it's it's more terrifying thinking that that there is meaning and that there is a consequence to your actions. Right. That's basically, what you're saying. Yes, right? exactly. It's more terrifying to think that there are consequences to the things you do. Then that, you, that, that you can that are do gonna, whatever you want, and then you'll die and go into right. Oblivion. That you may have to like, like experience those consequences for eternity, right? You know this this, this idea that they have of like, well, you're going to burn in hell forever, well, whatever. But if you think that, then yeah, I can see how an atheist would be more terrified of that, right? This is what was it called? Pascal's wager, right? This is a, a, Pascal's wager was basically like it's even if you don't really kind of believe in God you're better off pretending you yeah, do and kind of like going through the motions because if it's, if God isn't true and you die and, and, and nothing and there's nothing, you're fine. Right. All religious people who die and there's nothing that they're, they're fine. Right. They're, <laughs> they're gone. But anybody who didn't believe in God 
and dies to find out there is one, they're fucked, right? So <laughs> Pascal's wager is like, you probably should go through the motions because you, that's, I mean, that's the sm- if you were a gambling a person, this bet. is the, the safe bet. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like a, a poker term called being pot committed where you have enough money invested that making the call, even though you think you're going to lose. Yeah. It is statistically better for you to make the call than to not make it. Right. Yeah. I don't really understand the math behind it. I just know that it's true. But yeah. like it, it's pretty complicated. But yeah, if you were to fold at this point and you, you did screw that up. and you did that regularly, you would yeah. Have, yeah. It's better to it's better to make the call. Exactly. Because there's a chance that they're bluffing, yeah. right? Yeah. So Pascal's wager is basically like you need to pretend that you believe in God at least. You know, go through the motions guy, because if he is real and you didn't believe in him, you're fucked. Yeah. But if he's not real, no one cares. Because they die and there's nothing there. <laughs> one thing we definitely know is true. Snakes. Snakes. Exist. That's right. <laughs> then we're going to come up with the last segment, and Brett is going to tell us about another weird god called Ahura Mazda. He made little, like, Japanese cars. Are you really? <laughs> well, I mean, I can go into the beginnings of it. I still have... Yeah. Just don't I tell can. me you drove all the way out here to not talk about Ahura Mazda. I, be- I, have not, I have yet to figure out what is the first thing that would make Ahura Mazda most happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, we'll take a break. Yeah, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, for part two of the final segment of the final hour of Snake Bros, Take because two. I didn't hit record the first time, so we're going to repeat everything exactly as it was said before. We are in the 10 by 10 by 10 Danger Cube of Science, high atop the Edwards Plateau, in yep. the Texas Hill Country, and we have the official show observer in the cube. Brett England, and he's been doing some research, and I was asking in the first take, <laughs> uh, so how this came about, like... Well, first What's, he said that like he's going to talk about something that material scientists think is bullshit. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I said that that's what the show is about. It's about everything that science thinks is bullshit. <laughs> and then you said, how did this come about? Yeah, I think that's how it went. <laughs> okay. Something like that. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> I just wanted to get that back in there because I thought that was cool. Yeah. That's what this show is about. Everything that science thinks is bullshit. So, yeah, like Brett was hanging out at the top in the tower with me one day. And we were talking about ancient shit like we we're always doing, talking about pyramids and stuff. <clears> and then I, I, I was just like, you know, there's this really weird – fucking religion it was like a it was a monotheism that just kind of came out of nowhere in in the middle east uh back in the day and it was called zoroastrianism and it was really strange and like he was like what he looked it up on his phone and then he was just like for the next for the rest of the day he's like holy shit holy shit (laughs) and he started reading passages to me and i'm like holy shit that is fucking weirder than i thought it was (laughs) so i was like you should like he was really into it so i was like you should like you know do some segments on it on the show so that's part of the reason why we had him out here tonight so so, uh, yeah, we'll call this Zoroastrianism part one. Um, <laughs> Take two. <laughs> Take two, part one. And no, it's great because much like the podcast, the first recording or what would have been recorded, it's lost forever. And so now we start at number two. <laughs> we only two. have like 6% of what we've been That's said. That's what you say. This is Zoroastrianism part two. Yeah. <laughs> part one is not. That's right. There is no episode one, and we only have 6% of what's been said about Zoroastrianism tonight. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> like actually when you did that and I think the first time around I pointed out that you do this to me all the time like you say something and I'm like fuck I had stuff to do this week <laughs> thanks right. man yeah <laughs> damn it I had shit to do um, but one of the first things that struck me so I found their their only remaining holy text called the Zen Devesta like, which name. the structure after it's been translated to English the way that things are said are so weird like there's a conversation between Zarathustra who the Greeks called Zoroaster yeah um, and Ahura Mazda, the god, and he, the way that he poses it, Ahura Mazda, what is the thing that would make, or makes the most happy? Yeah. And he says, the thing that makes Ahura Mazda first most happy, and then second most happy, and it's like a list of commandments yeah. almost, but just the structure of that as it sits, because you can take some, like, liberties when you translate. Yeah. But that's just how it translates. It's not like... What things should I do that are 
going to keep me righteous, like the Ten Commandments. They're right. in no particular order. These are ordered. Like, Ahura Mazda wants this shit most. Yeah, he's, he's got then priorities, this, man. Yeah. yeah. He's got his priorities in, in line. Well, I think there's there's some correlation to the Bible. Like, they say, you know, this is most pleasing to, to God or whatever. Yeah, and that's Ahura Mazda's response. Yeah. Ahura Mazda finds most pleasing. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> this is what makes me most happy. Okay, right. <laughs> and um, it, it's really interesting because as I went to read it, so the copy that I found that's actually, if anybody wants to look into it, and it is really great stuff, the best source that I found is actually at sacredtext.com. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That's, my, that's my spot. And they right? have a preface <laughs> of just out. four of these gigantic pages that are, before you even get to the text, talk about all of the historical freaking melee that yeah. has been had over this because in ancient Greece they viewed uh, Zarathustra as this incredible sage. Yeah. Right? He was infinitely wise and he was like as, as smart and most awesomely academic Greek as anyone could ever be even though he was Persian. But... Do you remember the story of him kind of like uh, her, her Mazda being like, you know, hey, you want to do this? And he's like, uh, no. And he <laughs> <laughs> tell that story as badass. <laughs> um <laughs> It's, like how he became the sage. Of- yeah, essentially, it, it it's really weird. So he is sent basically word of it's it's almost like a you are to be the prophet of Ahura Mazda, and he's like, I don't want to. Yeah, he's like that that <laughs> does not interest me or sound <laughs> yeah. like a thing I want to do at all. And then, and it's sent by like a bird, and then another bird comes, and then there's symbolism and imagery there that is lost to us now, but there's animal messengers that are sent and then yeah. finally when he sees one that just strikes him is like holy crap I better take this seriously then he's like okay now I'm ready to listen and Ahura Mazda comes to him and that's when like Ahura Mazda, that's when they start having the conversation about the things that make Ahura Mazda most happy right and it's like just that on its own you look at it and it um and I started reading it to try to find parallels or comparisons that could be made to the well established well researched you know common yeah. known faiths, mostly, you know, Judeo Christian ethic, um, and others. And they're just not there. Yeah, they're not there. Like things like uh the fact that you do not bury the dead. Yeah. You do not like you leave them out. They actually have these in Iran still. Yeah. Giant like think of like a a coffee cup that's like sort of shallow. Like a coffee cup and and it's like <laughs> 10 to 15 feet off the ground. It's made of stone and there's these little like channels in it because that's where you lay the bodies so that the carrion fowl can come down and the dogs can eat them. Yeah. That, that's, um, and that's, that's practiced mm. by some indigenous people. Like they don't yeah. believe in, they don't believe in, in, in confining to the earth, the dead. They believe in like returning everything to nature. And then once you're, and then they go gather your bones, they call it laying in state, right? Yeah. Get, yeah. And you're, once you're down to, to the bones, they gather up the skeleton and they'll like, they'll kind of like put it in a little alcove somewhere. Right. Yeah. And, um, there was a huge, like, fight from, I think it's like 1650 till about 1890 or so. BC? Uh, no, AD with uh, the scholars who were studying it. And the insistence was upon the fact that it was derived from Vedic texts. Oh, yeah. So that, that not only did they come from the same source, but that Zoroastrianism had kind of grown as a... Like a, a like a cult sort of, of fork a, that had come off of the same yeah. path, yes. but that it was a fork away from um, the Vedic texts and the precursor to Hinduism. Yeah, so that would be a huge fight because during those periods, they the scholars believed in the uh, the Aryan invasion, right? And, that, and the prominence <clears throat> of the Vedic texts were not that old and came from right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the thing that's ultimately been discovered. And the first translation was done by this French guy, and literally everyone turned to him, and they were like, "There's no way, <laughs> nope." Everything you've that said book is did wrong. Did not say that. Yeah, <laughs> um, we know from the Greeks that Zarathustra was this, 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 and this, and these things, and no, it has to do with the Vedic text. Look, man, I'm, and he basically goes, "No, this is this is what it says." No, <laughs> and. Yeah. Uh, like the biggest problem they had with it was the fact that it it completely showed that in no way, shape, or form, maybe they came from the same root, but they were two individual 
yeah. unique points coming off of that node. I mean, one thing you cannot say about the Vedic texts is that they were monotheistic. Right. <laughs> And <laughs> the Hindus have like thousands and thousands. Right, of and, and Mazdaism was it was yeah. the, like aside from that one brief period in Egypt referenced before, where all of a sudden there's only one God. Yeah, and that seemed um, to be the same period. Yeah, yeah. The Zoroastrianism is a monotheistic belief. There is no other God. Yeah. Um, and some and of that the things is what makes Ahura Mazda most happy. Do they yeah. it, do they talk a lot about like? creation or is it more like the god is just like going around doing stuff and that that's another interesting thing is he, um, is he a man like god or you know what so i'm saying it, like does he have they a don't, physical form they don't necessarily yeah the his representation's kind of weird yeah he he's depicted as as standing in a flying disc like there's the there's a circle oh, yeah. yeah with the wings and it's got the yeah. two legs coming out and he's yeah. always standing in it yeah that's a hura mazda oh okay like he's basically an alien in a spaceship like yeah. It's, yeah it's clear and um, <laughs> so he, so because like my new thing right now is like, and this is one of the reasons gods why I'm planets. listening to Enoch. Enoch is that gods are like sort of personified astronomical you know, bodies, astronomical bodies right. that, that do stuff. Yeah, and they affect the world and they they change shit and whatever. So do you? So that'd be interesting. Like a, a Hura Mazda could be their name for Venus. It potentially. I mean, it it's really difficult. And one of the big problems is that. Most what of their Venus texts. Most happy. Space, space. <laughs> so one of the biggest problems is that they have a prior knowledge of through oral tradition, like the things they used to have. Time and space. Like a majority of the practicing uh, Zoroastrians now live in India. Yeah. Um, mm, and because if they, in were, India. if they were, because they were a branch from the Vedic. <laughs> right, and that's another reason why well, they were trying to practice. It, in. If they were trying to practice it where they originally were, they would be dead. Right. Yeah. There was a uh, an invasion uh, of Islam that came up, and basically it was the death of uh, Persia, you know, yeah. Babylon. That whole yeah. tradition stopped right there. And the way that they did it was actually kind of funny, you know, when you look at it historically, because you didn't have to be there. Like they didn't <laughs> force conversion. They yeah, didn't yeah. force conversion, but it was like, oh. Well, yeah, it's we, know, we know that there's a shortage of all these foodstuffs right now, but if you practice Islam, we've got this big warehouse over here and you can have all you want. If you're a Zoroastrian, then uh, you're just going to have to go off and die. Yeah. So yeah, like, I think it's this dimitude, right? They have this idea of like you're two thirds of a person or whatever, like right. that kind of concept. Yeah. So what ended up happening was they had one group that stayed and continued to practice. So there is still a small group in a in Iran, that whole region, Iraq there, but there was a group that left and they basically sought asylum and a king in, um, one of the provinces of India was like, well, I mean, if you guys aren't going to start any shit, then like, yeah, you can, you can live here. One more God won't matter to us. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We won't even notice. (laughs) And, um, so that's essentially what happened in their travel and in that conquest and the, you know, the whole process all of their texts were destroyed. Yeah. Um, oh, what remains is like basically a prayer book um, in a lot of ways, which is why it also reads so strangely. Yeah, it reads like the Psalms. But, the, but they had oral tradition or I – mean, it, it, Of what – they it's sort of like the priests who had the texts, who had read through them. I mean imagine it in terms of like there's a, a minister at a church now. Um, he may be able to quote scripture, but ask him specifically to recite the whole Bible. Yeah. And would, you're, you're not necessarily going to have it there. I would say that of the vast majority of our knowledge about Zoroastrianism did not come from the people that still practice it, but came from ancient shit we've found since, like tablets that were buried or hidden that did not get destroyed when the, mm. the you know what I'm saying? Like there, there's carvings of like the, that they found of, of Hura Mazda leading people, you know, like all that. Kind of, that's where we, that's the vast majority of our knowledge has come from has come from like ancient ruins that have yielded up tablets of non-destroyed Zoroastrianism hmm. stuff. And the other interesting thing is that the the text that we do have is this is part of the way that it was justified that you can't say that this has any connection to the Vedic text. So hmm. ancient Persian is a language. Yeah. Zend itself is a language. When the Greeks came and basically occupied um, that region, there was a sort of hybrid or new language created, sort of like a, a Creole or something, right? Yeah. yeah. That was Zend. 
this text is written in the Zend language. So it puts a direct time on, you know, kind of when this would have been there. Yeah. Because it isn't a thing that would have been spoken by them had they been, you know, had Previous it been degrees, yeah. historically when they said that it was written. Mm. Um, and that just throws another monkey wrench into the whole thing. Like researching this, the one thing that I have found that is unilaterally like whole thing is, well, uh, okay, well, if you take this, then, then maybe, maybe you could say that, but if you say that, they have no idea. Like yeah. it is so scrambled yeah. that it, it almost becomes incomprehensible. And if you read the translations, the, the things that you see, and you can draw these parallels to, even if you do that, it's difficult to take any line of thought that you can run away from that with. But there are some things that are really, really interesting and kind of become usable. For example, the uh, the great mountain that's at the navel of the earth. Uh, yeah. In Hinduism, <clears throat> I forget what they call it at the moment. Uh, um, but it's basically the center of the earth, this mountain. Yeah. And it's like the origin. It's They circumnavigate it every year. Right. Yeah. It's the equivalent of a, it's like a giant pyramid of Yggdrasil, which is the tree of life. Well, this is the same sort of concept, but it's a mountain. That's present in Hinduism. It's present here. Kailash. Um, That's it. In Mazdaism. And they both speak of it in the same terms, in the same yeah. thought processes. And what it really does show is that the Vedic texts, these texts, these religions that have come from them are creations or birthed by another yeah, thing. Yeah, some deeper, more ancient That thing. is more ancient and it is apparently powerful enough. Yeah. That, Kailash, you know, Kailash is supposed to be the place where Brahma sleeps. So right? I guess right. what, what I was getting at really, it, and I should ask more directly, do you think this, like after looking into it, that the whole thing was sprung up because like some Nefa flew down there in a spaceship and just like, you know, is that, is, is that, because, you know, like we were just talking about the Book of Enoch. And right. That's kind of what it seems like, yeah. you know. It seems like a, a Nefa flew down and started... They just like yeah. Anefa shows up and like pulls him into a spaceship and then shows him all this stuff and tells him a bunch of propaganda and then he goes and starts teaching it. Yeah, uh, Ahura Mazda seems to have been somewhat more benevolent than that, at least in the sense that like there's all this data that we have now that 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 show like the underground cities. Right. right. Yeah, talk it, about that. It seems more to me like Ahura Mazda, if you're trying to give him an archetype, is more in line with maybe like Viracocha, where he's coming. Yeah. He's, he's trying to teach. And like so, the things tries to preserve. Yeah, the things yeah. that make Ahura Mazda most happy are the things that are best for a person to do if they wish to Become not get and dysentery and die. <laughs> right, like yeah. get, get civilized. Yeah, um, yeah. He's it, trying to keep them alive. Like, like he directs them to, to to build those enormous underground cities in Turkey. There, there's carvings of Ahura Mazda like in the walls and stuff, like showing him like floating above the people that are doing all the work. Yeah. So like it, it looks like he's try, he he comes down and he like sort of. He wants this guy to be his spokesperson, right? But he doesn't fill him full of propaganda. He basically is like, "Look, we got it. We got a lot of work to do. If you guys are going to live through this thing that's coming in the next, you know." And so, they, and then they do all this work and shit, and they live underground through these cataclysms mm. because of Ahura Mazda. Trying, he's trying to save them, you know. Uh, yeah, and he's, at least that was the the, the what it, I got from some of it. Yeah. It, it definitely does follow that kind of line, and it's also interesting because Ahura Mazda has an enemy. Right, there's like an anti Ahura Mazda. Yeah. Um, and of course being he's a Ahura Nissan. <laughs> yeah. He's like a yeah, it's like a Mitsubishi. Um, you know, and of course being the show observer, I'm totally prepared with my facts. You guys <laughs> could stall for a couple of seconds. Um, while I look this up, there's actually a very interesting thing. This is probably the most like mind altering thing that I found. So the Magi are derived from Mazdaism. They were the yeah. the fire temples, the worshippers of fire, the yeah. Magi. Mm. The Magi are like and you hear about their presence through the region for yeah. ever, like back into antiquity and all the way up into you know like the And they seem to come from nowhere, of course. They popped out of the ground. And they have weird fire magic in yeah. like their fire temples. It's just very strange practice, They're sort of like Druid. Fire ritual dude. Yeah. But the the Magi come from Mazdaism. Yeah, the three kings. Mazdas. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the so why you're still looking that up? Okay, yeah. So like the the if, these underground cities in Turkey like have been fascinating me for a long time, and apparently they stem from from this whatever happened here with with Zoroastrianism, and it, and it does appear to be like an not, not an outlier, but it is is unique. Like it's um. Was it an isochron, like geologists call it, like this unique event that happens very quickly, mm-hmm. you know, it comes out of nowhere, happens very quickly and changes everything. Like, it's like that. It's like this, this, this being or whatever it comes like, or just maybe if you just want to call it a belief and just get rid of all the ideas of Nephas, like this man, Z- uh, Zoroaster, like suddenly begins to say all this shit. And, and like he, you know, he's, he's saying that he's being talked to by a God, Right. But he correctly leads people into like digging underground and making these enormous cities that they go to live in, in which they survive this cataclysm. And they say it was a cataclysm of ice. Okay, that the that the surface of the world became uninhabitable by cold. Okay, because of the passage, the close passage of astronomical bodies of of evil gods. Right, uh, and that makes sense because when you look at these underground cities in Turkey, they don't make any sense. In uh, like people try to say that they were done for defensive, but the, there's. There's, they have these like amazing ventilation that all these holes ending up on the surface. And if you were trying to hide from an invading army, that would be deadly. They would just be yeah. pouring, bur- you know, bur- burning oil down all your fucking breathing holes, and you would die. Or so sitting that, on them and farting and stuff. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, we're dying down here. And, but yeah, and and like the doorways, the doorways do look defensive because they're all rolling. They, they're these enormous rolling stones, right? right? And if, so if you're on the outside of the door. Right on the inside of the door, there's a big handle that you can grab and like make it roll, and it's, it rolls in a track. Okay, mm-hmm. but the 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 portal that it covers is also circular, but it's much smaller than the stone. That you, so like on the outside, all you see is like this circle that has a smooth piece. Yeah. You can't do anything with it because the rock is too big for you to move with your hands from the outside. Yeah, that's but it also nice. makes a really good seal because the, the 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 rolling stones are like you know a foot thick. They make a, an excellent insulating st- seal against like. Deep cold, right? It, like, it, so it's just another arc, right? It's, yeah, it is an arc. Like, if you think about it, all the ventilation, and the ventilation is insane. Like, it has to be technological because there are tiny little tubes and pipes that go up multiple levels through all. You know, like how do they do that? Like this little one-inch tube that you know connects this board room straight through the rock, right? Board straight all the way up to the surface. You know, going between the hallways and shit of other rooms above and everything like that. They held a whole marketplaces down there, like pre-built. And then they've recently found out that all of the cities that are underground in that area have a deep connect. They have subways below, like I call them subways. But like if you go all the way to the bottom, there are these enormous hubs of gigantic roads that go off to the other cities miles and miles away through the rock. Oh, my God. Right. Freaking They're awesome. all connected. Now, you know, they, they, it's possible that they did, did all the digging and got into them and then did the work to connect them while they were living. What are they going to do with all the dirt? That's true. All like I was like, where, where, where do they put it? They found a gigantic chasm somewhere, and they dumped it all in there. I don't know, but yeah, they're, they're connected by miles and miles and miles of roads. And have they haven't they? So far, they say they haven't been explored. But they go down there and they see just whoo, goes off that way. This one goes off to the northeast, where they know there's another city over there. And every one that they find is bigger than the one that they found before. Like they when they found Darren Q U, they were like, oh my god, it's twelve levels deep and can hold forty thousand people. Then they found oh like, another one that – I can't remember the names of them all. But the most recent one they found, they said it could hold – they didn't give it an exact number. They said it could hold hundreds of thousands of people for thousands of years. And that it had enormous roads at the bottom. That There were like 12 of them that went off in every direction. And I'm just like, holy shit. And then, of course, the surface of that whole area is covered in those crazy cart ruts. You know, this that whole area is just like, what the fuck was going on here? You know? So and all of these are like have carvings of Ahura Mazda in the side. Yeah, th- there are places Holy there. Yeah, shit. <laughs> yeah. Dude? He's that gigantic dude. Like he's. It's weird because the, the the winged disc we see in all these cultures. Egypt right. had it, but yeah. but in Ahura's Mazda you see the he's same like sticking up. From yeah, the top. this yeah. guy is like standing in it, like you yeah. know, and it comes up to his waist or whatever. He's right. like, hmm? <laughs> you know, know, he's pointing that way. <clears throat> it's interesting <laughs> because with the absence of original texts or like even records to try to decipher. Seeing him all over these places, you would think that maybe someone would go, hey, we should maybe look into these more and <laughs> see if we can find anything from us. No, cover it with dirt. Yeah. Well, like, uh, like stop digging right now. All of these cities have been being found very recently. Right. But like, because, so the people that live in the areas, they have, they do this thing with, with water. They build cisterns into the limestone. Right. So beneath the house, they, they all dig these like cistern shaped things and they'll slowly fill up with water. Right. 
uh, or they or they fill it with water, whatever. But that's where they hold it. And like people are going down. It's, the story is always like they were going down to expand their basement or to expand their cistern, and they break into a part of this enormous underground city that nobody knew was there. Oh my god, that's so freaking Dude, awesome. Dude, I wouldn't tell anyone. I'd be like, yeah, my like, house is huge! Are there like artifacts and all that kind of stuff in there? Or are they just completely empty? Or what, what's it doesn't ever <clears throat> say. I always wonder that too. But I, I assume there must be artifacts because the most recent one that I read about, which is like the biggest one they've found so far, the guy was very old and he finally told it to authorities, but he had known about it for over 30 years and he explored it by himself. For So you know that there was shit in there, you know. Like he was Dude, that's think about that. Like awesome. you just like you have an entrance in your basement to this enormous, massive, ancient underground city that nobody fucking knows about. Holy oh shit! My God. People, all his neighbors, but it's like he hasn't come out of his house in like a, a week. <laughs> like, well, we, somebody should check on that. Do a wellness check on him. And he's like, he's not in there. He must be gone. No, he's down in that underground city, getting lost and dying. <laughs> so that would be so freaking awesome. Uh, I would never leave my house. <laughs> my property. I don't have to leave my house. I got a city beneath it. <laughs> yeah. And this is actually another thing that I found really interesting. Um, the name of the evil spirit is Angra Manu. Hmm. And he is the evil twin is, of Ahura Mazda. It's Angry Man. Yeah. Right. A- Angra Manu. Yeah. Manu. <laughs> but he's, he is the he polar opposite evil twin, almost like a yin yang or hmm. dare I say a Gemini? Gemini? Lil. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he basically his instructions, the things that make him most happy, the things that he's saying... The whole principle of the entire faith is do good, don't do bad. <laughs> like it, it's, and there's Be no excellent to each other. Yeah, it's essentially, and party and on, it's, dudes. <laughs> it's really interesting because it's based around things like you know if you have this community where people help each other and you like don't go around stealing from each other and you know like the same way that they talk about the civilizer, um, yeah, yeah, concept. And that's really all it is. And then there's also this list of things. And it's like, and if you choose to do this, you will fall into the ways of Angra Manu and bad uh, things will happen and so on and so forth. Um, guys, stop eating each other. Please just, you don't have to eat each other. <laughs> <laughs> right. You could wear butt flaps and not eat each other. <laughs> and it's, it's strange because it's also considered, although I haven't been able to determine why they consider it this, the oldest religion in the world. Yeah. Um, which others will argue is Hinduism. It's, I would say it's the taxes. oldest monotheistic religion in the right. world. And to me, what it really says, and this is the greatest like question mark at the end of it. Well, I guess the whole thing's kind of question mark after gigantic. question mark, but this Ramazda? is the big overall question mark. <laughs> what was before this? Because this came from something like this is not yeah, the origin the of man's, you know, theological development. But this and well, the text both come from some event, some history, some something. And whatever that is, like, that's what we should be looking for in my well, opinion. I, Take well, these things and trace them back to find Well, that. Their, their own story does say that, or, like, Ahura Mazda, the god, shows up and kind of starts this whole deal. Like, so maybe it doesn't have provenance. Except that it might have, it might have like, reflections of older beliefs, but you have this inclusion of a new... Because that's the idea. Is like Zoroaster was in an existing religious, spiritual, Persian right. environment, right? And then this this other being that is not in their pantheon at all, like shows up and says, "Look, like I'm a god, and like we got some shit to do." And like he kind of starts a new thing, right? But so there may be reflections of that. But I, but their own story says that this is a brand new deal that happened just because this guy showed up and says we've got to do this. And though. there are some parallels there, almost to like the new covenant, like yeah. the the showing up of. A new prophet who then says, yeah, the way you guys, we're not going to do that anymore. It's not working out. It's really, really time consuming. And you guys are all unhappy. Like, let's. There's a really interesting, I always thought this was interesting. There's a really strange story that comes from late Sumer about a returning God who comes back. Okay. So like after the, all the Anunnaki have left, they've, they've either, they've either gone into hiding right they've got they've like they no longer have a public persona they've gone into or they've they've completely departed earth there's this very strange story of this old woman who used to be a a young priestess in the temple of the god for her city that the anunnaki guy for her city or whatever and she was like young at the time now she's an old woman she's a grandmother right and she's got she's got this this grandchild a son a grand a grandson or whatever and he's kind of like um, as he grows older, she keeps returning to the temple, which is all in ruins. She keeps returning to the temple and doing all the rituals that she did as a priestess, begging for the 
the God to come back and saying that, like, if you come back, my, my grandson can be, he can be your, whatever they called him, the priest, the guy that was between the guy. And he was like, we will, we will follow all your rituals. We will, you know, please come back and help us. Cause they were, everything was falling apart. And, the, and the Anunnaki does, he sees her and he comes back and like by himself comes back, you know, leaving all of his people wherever they went, comes back and for the lifetime of her grandson remains in the city and it, it prospers again. That sounds like it could be the yeah, same. That actually sounds there's a lot of similarity. Yeah. There. That and the soon <coughs> so Sumerians are talking. Could have been Huh? Uh, her grandson could have been the guy like Zoroaster, Zoroaster, right. Zoroaster, yeah. The name of the the name of Ahur, Ahur, if this is the, the same guy, the Sumerians called him Sin. Think about right. that. Yeah. yeah. The god of the moon. That's the, the other fucking thing. wing disc. It's just like, okay. Yeah. That's the other thing in the book of Enoch when he talks about sin, I've been like everything that, that is associated with the sin like if you apply that dude to it yeah or like to be in sin is his city yeah it, it changes like, it, it all totally, yeah yeah <laughs> changes all of it like right and 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 since sin is a moon god the idea of the nighttime and the nighttime rituals and all this stuff you know yeah. like because it just makes sense like that you will be in darkness right <clears throat> yeah and the uh actual like, maybe it's, it was it's quant moon ship <laughs> <laughs> yes, spaceship, moon, a fucking spaceship, moon ship. And so, it, another thing that's interesting <laughs> that's is if you translate <laughs> Ahura Mazda, it's it's like mighty or great or highest wisdom. Small car. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it's not necessarily like most of the other faiths. When you have like a like God is referred to as like almighty, super powerful, like yeah, like, creator, everything. Just, blah, blah. Ahura Mazda is. Great and mighty wisdom. That's, That's cool. cool. Which is, you know, to me, it, it's like he's not. Why is he here? He because he just needs us to know this shit. Yeah, he's coming. He, it's a, clearly he's coming to assist. Right. And like that's why I connected it with that story of sin and the the old woman. But okay, so you said the magi, right? The magi. Wisdom. Yeah. Wizards. Yeah. Wizards. Magi. Wizardry. Fire wizards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a lot to be said there. And it one of the other things that's really interesting is no matter how far, like how deep you dig into this rabbit hole, theologians who have like made their entire career, like all of their contribution to like their field has dealt with Mazdaism and Ahura Mazda and Zarathustra slash Zoroaster. And literally have moved, like, the knowledge forward. It, just, it hasn't gone anywhere. Right. Um, they can't go anywhere. Because there's no new discovery. Like, there's no... Except for these massive... These giant cities, cities yeah. Right. There, there, there's no new discovery that will be accepted into the, into the canon of right. accepted knowledge. Like, there, there, are th- like still, there are still hundreds of thousands of untranslated Babylonian... Assyrian, Akkadian, and Sumerian texts that just, they lost, like, at some point, the funding for that shit dried up because it was, it was turning over too many, it was uh, offending too many people. The shit that was coming out of it was just not, they just, they just don't want it, you know? It just was like, it was. It Especially was when they, with, when they translated the one that was like a receipt for brain surgery. They were like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, stop. <laughs> yeah. Like the story of the, the, the Indian chief who like finally gets defeated, you know, and his whole family never to be defeated. And he hands over the talisman that, it, that his family had kept it. It's a Sumerian tablet. It's a receipt for a sale of a goat or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, um, <laughs> why is this here? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, that, is that it? We're out of time here. Yeah. The, uh, they're called the Parsi, by the way, the displaced. Uh, uh, Zoroastrians who are in India now, and they have all kinds of other problems they create because they have a completely different. They're quantifying it now. Yeah, they, then they have a completely different historical. Oh, and they like, get a, yeah, line they get offended. They draw back, and then they also yeah. say like we're the only true Mazdans because the ones who stayed were intimidated, and yeah, it's yeah. just it doesn't work out. Oh no, man. man. Well, I think that's about it for this episode, folks. Which episode is it? Forty-seven. Forty-seven. Is that a prime? Yeah, As a so. show observer, usually keeps track of that email and stuff. I don't know what that guy's deal is. Yeah, it sounds like he got into a wreck on the way here. Yeah, uh, show saw one, <laughs> saw one. <laughs> yeah, so you guys can get a hold of us at brothers of the serpent at gmail.com or you can go to the blog brothers of the serpent dot blogspot dot com. You can comment there. We got some, we got some great comments going on there. Uh, we appreciate that, guys, very much. Keep commenting. I will try to pay attention and re- reply. Um, very interested in what, whatever you guys have to say about the show. 
Uh, you can also go give us like five star reviews everywhere, <laughs> all over the place. And like go to Google and just like post pictures of five star reviews or whatever because you can't actually do them there. Uh, <laughs> take take a, like a screenshot of your five star review on iTunes and post it to Google. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and save that screenshot. You're going to put it lots of places. That's right. Just put it everywhere. Uh, yeah, that's right. So thank you guys very much. And like, here's one final question to think about. Why are wizards always depicted wearing pointy hats and robed with stars on them? Because they were astronomers for the long heads. <laughs> dun, dun. Dun, dun. Magic. Snakes. Snakes. Magic. Podcast.